Hi, good morning. Good morning. Yes. Welcome to Data Scientist 2.0. We were getting really jealous of that Industry 4.0 stuff, so we were. So Data Scientist 2.0. Delighted that you're all here. Um, this room is just bursting with talent. Bursting with talent. And I've done some data science on you all. No, really. Actually, some basic arithmetic in an Excel spreadsheet. And I've been calculating the talent that's in this room and your earning potential. And it's pretty big numbers. So I've made some assumptions. I've made uh, some assumptions that half the room are just starting on your career. And the other half, a bit like me, are about halfway through or a little bit further. I've assumed 2% compound annual growth in terms of your salary, earning potential. And I've calculated that this room could earn, over the next few years, £551,044,169. Uh, wow. <laughs> and that's assuming you all just get normal jobs. That's not taking into account the entrepreneurs in the room that will set up their companies and make billions. That's not including the people in the room that are going to use data to improve cancer care. That's not including the people in this room that are going to use data to improve public services. The people in this room are going to change the world. I really, truly believe that. And it's fantastic to have you here today. Um, Scotland's opportunity for data, and we've worked this out, over the next five years, it's going to be worth £20 billion pounds to our economy. And you and others with the skills and capability that we have are going to make that happen. So it's absolutely de delighted to have you here. And I was going to make a comment about the talent in this room compared to the talent in another room that's quite close to here, but I think this room wins. So you make it happen. And delighted to be here, delighted to co-host the event with MBN, our partners at MBN. Um, so I'm Gillian Doherty, I'm the Chief Executive of the Data Lab, the innovation centre uh, that focuses on helping drive economic and social benefit for Scotland and the creation of high value jobs by leveraging data science. But our mission is nothing less than helping Scotland maximise its value from data. It's a bold mission, but a really exciting one. And I'd be, I'll just click this forward if it works. Is it that one? I'm just going to ask Michael from MBN. Michael and his team at MBN, fantastic team actually, have been working with us over the last two and a half years or so on our journey. Um, and I've put together this event today and I'd be delighted to welcome Michael to say a few words and then I'll be back to introduce our first speaker. Michael. Hey, thanks very much, Jillian. Hey. As a lot, a lot of people will know in the room, my name's Michael from MBN Solutions. Uh, we, we're, we're absolutely delighted to be here today. And I think the, the, main, the main kind of message for, from today from myself is, is, is about the, the community. Uh, to, to, to have probably over 200 people uh, attending today is a, it's a huge testament to, to Scotland and to the data science and technology community. Uh, myself, I've, I've, we've been, uh, MBN Solutions, we've been running now for, for 10 years. And, and as Gillian says, up until about maybe two and a half years ago, eh, probably 90% of the candidates we placed within data science and analytics were, probably 95% were outside of Scotland. And over the, over the past two years, two and a half years, we've seen a massive eh, increase in eh, Scottish-based businesses eh, taking on talent, which, it, which is great to see as well. Also great for myself, so I'm not up and down to London every every other week, so that's a plus side as well. Uh, but again, the, 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 uh, we wanted to put on this event because uh, Gillian will touch, well, Rob and, and others will touch more on, on the project and the real reason why we're here. Uh, there, was, there was 90 funded MSE students, and I, I, I personally believe it's been one of the most uh, rewarding projects MBN have, have worked on. Uh, the, the fact that over there was over fifth, there was around fifty students uh, placed into Scottish-based businesses uh, for their twelve-week summer placements, we think is absolutely fantastic. Uh, even the fact that there's that there was thirty-nine host companies uh, took part in this project as well. 
So all these all these companies based on on the on the wall here took on the uh, students, which we think is absolutely fantastic. So we're very we're very proud to have worked on this project. And uh, Rob Huggins, who we'll be talking later on today, he uh, I, I've seen it with my own eyes the, the amount of work he put into that over a good few months. Uh, he kind of put everything into that. So and thanks to the Data Lab for giving us the opportunity to work on this as well. It's been it's been really good. And uh, this is the thanks thanks very much to all the universities who also uh, t t took part in the project and, and this is where the students came from as well and it's great to see and there's probably maybe around 80 or 90 students here today so it's great to see that as well and and again we would really like to thank the, the sponsors and the exhibitors who uh, have helped support today so all the logos and names are there so thanks very much and and a, a, a big thanks to the speakers uh, well, Sanjay even and Amy have travelled up from London, so thanks very much for that. And, and all the other speakers who have uh, taken time out of their busy said schedule to come along and, and support this event today. But that basically, that, that's it for me. Really, really glad to be here. It's, it's good to see so many friendly faces in, in the community growing. And just one last, uh, just one last thing be before I uh, hand it back to Gillian. I was speaking to uh, a data scientist. Uh, she's in the audience today. A friend now of... Uh, and and she was looking probably for her career in Scotland maybe two and a half three years ago, and I can remember that even back back then there was there was very bit there, there there wasn't many places for a, a data scientist to go in Scotland back then if you maybe the, if you were looking at doing some kind of real advanced analytics uh, data science there was there was a, a couple of companies a uh, couple of startups uh, some of the bigger banks were doing more more kind of insight and analytics but 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 now there's uh, there's, there's so many companies in Scotland doing uh, much much more advanced analytics and data science and you've got you've got a lot of the banks doing it now you've got you've got startups there's I'm speaking to to businesses on a weekly or fortnightly basis say uh, coming in from maybe the states who are, are really keen to come and set up in Scotland as well so just a great 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 testament to Scotland uh, welcome everybody and hope everybody's a great day cheers Jillian Thanks, Michael. And what a fantastic job these guys did in terms of uh, getting placements for the students that are here. So I'm going get, to get you to move around a bit before I introduce the first speaker. Hands up if you were on the MSc studentship last year. Right. Hands up if you've got a permanent job. Right. Fantastic. If you haven't let us know whether you've got a permanent job, come and let us know at the Data Lab stand. It's really, really important because I'm about to go and ask for a load more money, <laughs> right? And I need your testimonials that you're in jobs helped along the pathway by the Data Lab. Hands up the companies that participated in the program this year. If you've hired a data scientist off the program, come and let us know. Come and give us your testimonials. We are just about to embark, in two weeks' time, we start this roller coaster all over again. We have 130 students studentship starting. We've added four more universities, new courses, new content, and we're going to be looking for placements for every single one of them next year. So if you participated this year, you loved it, take more next year. If you speak to your friends, your colleagues, your peers, let them know how good this program is. Please do that. Um, I'd also like to welcome Kinross High School. Wave out at the back there. Class full of higher statistics students, yeah, data scientists of the future, <laughs> delighted to have you here. And I would encourage you to make the most of the day. There's loads of goodies upstairs. I even saw Dunkin' Donuts. You'll be, you know, make the most of the day. Just get a little bit of insight of the careers that you're going to get a chance to embark on. It's absolutely brilliant. And I mentioned earlier using data for good. There's one of the companies here in Scotland called Brainwave. Uh, they're a startup, well, scaling up now, and they're a team of data scientists here in Scotland. And they downed tools over the weekend, and they worked on pulling together data sets, GIS data, satellite data, urban data, all in one place, and made it available to the disaster relief agencies in the Caribbean and Florida after the hurricane. Can we just give them a round of applause? <laughs> So we'll get on with the day now. Um, this day is yours. You need to make the most of it. There are people hiring. There's people looking to get jobs. Mingo, I am 
waiting to hear the number of people that come later and said, I've been offered a job today. So that'll be fantastic. I'm delighted to welcome Sanjeevan from Channel 4, who's going to be our first speaker this morning. So thank you very much for coming up from London to see what all this fuss is about going on in Scotland, because there is a real buzz up here. Um, and I'm delighted to have you. So I'll just make sure I don't make any mistakes. So Sanjeevan started his career in investment banking in Australia. Then you moved to management consulting in PwC. You went to some startups in Silicon Valley, back to the UK to Dunhumby, for those who don't know, Tesco Club Card started that. And now is head of data science at Channel 4. I'm a little worried about what he knows about my viewing habits <laughs> and what he's doing with it, but he might share that with us. So you've moved around a lot. Did you know Scotland was voted the most beautiful country in the world last week? <laughs> you know, just saying, like. So I'm delighted to welcome you and uh, give him a big round of applause, Sanjeevan. <laughs> Uh, so, morning everybody. Um, just by way of background, in case you don't know anything about Channel 4, um, we're a, uh, a, uh, a non-for-profit uh, public service broadcaster. Uh, so what that means is uh, we actually don't get any money from the BBC licence fee that we all pay. Uh, we're completely self-sufficient, so all of our revenue is generated from advertising, uh, and we also have a public service remit which is all about investing into the creative in, uh, industry in terms of the small indies and smaller gaming companies. So it's all about creating uh, a creative ecosystem and network in terms of how Channel 4 puts its money back into uh, the local economy. Um, we turn over about a billion, roughly, uh, of which about 10% or 100 million is digital revenue, so anyone that watches uh, all four or catch-up services, and the rest of that revenue comes from our traditional sort of linear TV advertising. Um, so in terms of my background, I think you've already heard, um, but I guess about six years ago, uh, I was then hired by our CEO uh, to sort of, one, develop a data strategy, uh, two, to then build out all the capabilities. So if you think about Channel 4, a very creative, innovative organization, suddenly starting to think about science and data science and how do those two worlds come together, uh, and then deliver value in terms of how we're gonna drive both creative innovation and commercial innovation. Um, so, <clears throat> I've talked a little bit about, about me, but in terms of what my team looks like, um, we have two data strategists, uh, and I'll get on to what they do a bit later on, but in essence, what they try and do is they sell the art of the possible into our business. Uh, and again, the nuance of a very creative organization starting to work with and understand what the role of science is can be quite convoluted and quite complex, and I'll get on to some of the challenges we've gone through culturally. Uh, but these two, in essence, play that role. They go into the business, understand the business process, develop ideas, work with a data science team, and then, I guess, deploy or roll those ideas out. So that's quite a key role for us in terms of how do you realize value from data and data science in an organization that's incredibly creative. We then have a team of uh, data scientists, uh, and interestingly, most of them were graduates uh, two years ago and have come through the graduate program uh, at Channel 4. And then we have an entire team of graduates, of which you'll hear from Amy later on. So if you look at that picture, most of Channel 4's data science function is run by graduates. So we only have the yellow boxes and the top two, that top tier are actually experienced hires. Everybody else at Channel 4, from a, from a data science perspective, is through our graduate program. And I'll get on to why we did that. Uh, part of it was our work with MBN, when we looked at recruiting experienced hires. And it's really challenging to find data scientists that can fit culturally in a, in a creative organization, can speak the language of content, and yet still deliver value. Uh, and I think through the work with MBN, we realized actually we had to go with a bottom-up graduate program, and that's why we have such an extensive program at the moment. In terms of the average age, and this is the other cultural bias we have, so the average age of the employee at Channel 4 is about 40. The average age of my team is 25. So that culturally poses some other challenges in terms of how my team likes to work what time of day they want to work. <laughs> Do they need to come into the office? Um, whereas the rest of the organization, we, you know, they will have desks, they've got a desk phone, why? Uh, so I think that poses some challenges for us in terms of a new team, a new capability, trying to fuse science with art and do all of this in a way that sort of brings about change and sustainable change in a very creative organization that's having a number of macro things happening in the market as well. So I'll, I'll tell you and I'll talk you through, um, I guess, the journey we've been on over those six years. And I guess all of the 
uh, changes that we've had to adopt. And I guess I'll do this classically through our programming. So a bit like food unwrapped, when you discover what actually goes into your meat or goes into jelly. I think the first phase of our um, experience at the channel is very much one of shock. Uh, and the reason I ex explain that is if you're a data scientist uh, in our team, uh, one of the first things you do is really understand how does commissioning work, how does scheduling work, how does ad sales work, and you start to learn all of these different business processes. And so through that process, you start to identify opportunities. An example here would be we, we think we can classify or predict a certain audience better than anyone else can. And by doing so, we can create a new advertising product that delivers more revenue into our business that means we can spend more on our content. So that's a quite simple idea. And one of our data scientists had that idea. Now, in order to make that idea happen, they had to go over and talk to ad sales. And ad sales were quite receptive to it. So yeah, this is quite good, you know, quite like this. It'd be great to have a new product that we could take to market and trade with our agencies. But ad sales wouldn't make that call. They sent our team off to talk to ad ops to understand, actually, to practically get this to work, what do you need to do with the ad server? And how do you plan the campaign? And what's that actually going to look like in practical terms? They also wouldn't commit. So then they sent us off to legal to make sure that everything we were going to do with all this data was going to be on the right side of the Data Protection Act. And with GDPR coming in, equally would be on the right side. And there's loads of opportunities, as I'm sure many of you are aware, to you know, uh, listen to the Twitter fire hose, scrape things from social media, all of these things with cookie matching and all this sophistication we could do, but making sure we did that on the right side of what Channel 4 stood for. But again, legal wouldn't approve it. They sent us on to the product team, because if we want to do any of this, we need the product team to make a change to all four, to capture the data, to make sure the data science team gets it in the right format to then do the models. But product team had their own roadmap. They're trying to launch new products and features on all four, like pause and resume, uh, catch up or restart live uh, video. Uh, so they're, they're thinking about this as a product, kind of get it, but they've got a day job and when are they going to squeeze these changes in? But product wouldn't make the call either. They sent us on to the technology teams, because ultimately, if you're going to make a change to the product, you need to get technology to fund the change and technology to kind of implement the change. Technology wouldn't make the call. You're seeing where this is going, right? Uh, they sent us on to InfoSec, which is all around whatever changes you're going to make, are you sure that those changes are secure from a, uh, an InfoSec perspective? So are there ports that are going to be left open inadvertently? Are there patches on software that we might be using on the open source community that isn't secure? Again, so we had to run it by InfoSec, but they wouldn't approve it. They went on to marketing, because if we're going to take a new product to market, surely our brand team and marketing team need to kind of talk about it in a very Channel 4 tone of voice and take it to market in a very Channel 4 way. Again, marketing wouldn't make the call. Uh, they went on to send us to platform owners. So if you think about where all four can be experienced, you can watch it on an Xbox or a PS4 or a Samsung TV. And all of those relationships with those platform owners is managed by somebody else in our business. But if we're going to make a change to the product, we've got to get the platform owners like Samsung and Xbox to kind of play a game with us and make those changes. Product sent us on to commissioning, because if we're going to do these changes, we need to kind of understand what content are we going to commission, and therefore how you can monetize that content more effectively. Commissioning sent us on to scheduling, because it's great that we're going to commission it, but when's it actually going to transmit, and how are you going to exploit the value in that? Finally, scheduling sent us back to ad sales, because they were like, well, you know, it's a great idea, but ad sales needs to be the one that's going to monetize this, so you need to go back and talk to them. Finally, ad sales were like, well, I kind of get it, but unless agencies aren't going to buy and brands aren't going to buy this product, pointless doing this, so go talk to agencies and brands. And I guess, oh, let me just go back a sec. I guess. The big learn for us throughout this entire process is that while data science function and the strategy was all very clear and we had top-down sponsorship from our CEO, the practical challenges of actually getting this stuff through an organization like Channel 4 were quite complex and convoluted. Um, and I guess for us, um, the, the sheer scale of all the parts of our business that we had to touch, all the different moving parts that we had to influence, all the different roadmaps that we'd have to get things onto on top of their day jobs became quite a sort of what the hell is this kind of, kind of moment for all of us when we first started? Um, and that was the first challenge for us, because if you think about it, we had a, a very young, enthusiastic, energetic team that were really eager to create value in a creative organization, yet we met with this organizationally in terms of how you're going to make those things happen. So that was one of our first challenges from a cultural perspective. Moving on, denial. So a bit like um, one born every minute. 
when, you, when you're a first-time parent, you think it's not really going to change your life. Um, for us, what happened was uh, the data science team, and we have a partnership with, with academia, came up with loads and loads of ideas. Because part of our challenge was, because the business didn't really know what data science could do, I mean, they'd read about it, they'd heard about it in the wider uh, market. Obviously, everyone's heard about what Netflix does and how it commissions House of Cards and all these things. Um, it was really challenging for the business to come up with ideas and sort of say, here's how we'd like data science to solve a problem for us. So what we did quite early on is, once we understood the business, we started building a set of data products that we felt could add value. So we, we built um, forecasting tools that could forecast how our content would perform. Uh, we built optimization tools that would allow us to optimize content differently. Uh, we built um, recommender systems so that we could uh, personalize experience. But what we found when we built all these products was that while they were great ideas and it was couched in business context, the business didn't really adopt them uh, and it was really hard to operationalize them. And there were two key learnings that we had from this. Cool. Um, the first was around business usage. So how do you get the business to actually use these products? And what does that use case look like? Um, what are the changes you need to implement from business process perspective to kind of make those changes get adopted? So when ad ops do things a certain way that's been mapped out in a certain way in terms of process and technology, how do you get them to change that process to adopt something different? Uh, how does that change uh, make their lives easier or simpler or create more value? Uh, so for this, we have the data strategist. And their role very much is all around influencing and distributing our products and so getting our products used um, by other parts of our business. And that's very much an influencing role because you know, we're not experts in, in these different business functions. So they kind of look at us sort of slightly weirdly, like, well, what do you know about ad sales? What do you know about commissioning? What do you know about scheduling? And we don't, and that's like, perfectly acceptable. But what they try and do is influence and find uh, sponsors within these different departments that are sort of seeing the landscape change around them, seeing the role of data, or really more about robotic process automation or AI, and thoughts thinking, actually, I need to understand this a bit more. So we find a few sponsors within these different parts of our business to then create the opportunity and then work with us. But that in itself was never enough for us, and that didn't necessarily lead to success. The second part of this was what we call technology automation. So it's great we can build something in data science, in our data science environment. We have a, a cloud-based uh, AWS sort of ecosystem that we can play with. It's one thing to build it within our ecosystem. It's very different when you have to then productionize it and have it running automatically, but we don't have to worry about it anymore, but it just runs in the background. And that's really challenging for us. So not only was there challenges to get the business to use it, but there was also challenges from how do we get technology teams to automate things so that once we've built something, data scientists don't need to worry about it anymore. They can move on to the next project or the next problem and think about how do we create more value for the business. Now, on one hand, that sounds quite simple and quite easy, uh, but it can honestly take up to 18 or 24 months sometimes just to get a product we might develop actually automated so that my data scientist team never have to touch the thing again. And I'll get on some reasons as, as to why uh, in the next sort of stage of our development and evolution. Um, but I think the, the call out here uh, that we had quite early on was that it's great that we've got the ideas, uh, it's great that we understand the organisational landscape, but unless we can get the business to change, change their process, adopt the tools, unless we can get technology to automate for us, we're still kind of stuck in, in the middle of a slightly theoretical science kind of ivory tower function that doesn't really give a value to business. Anger, so how they sell. Um, this one's quite an interesting one. So we've gone through those first two stages. Uh, so the next one was, I guess, frustration and anger. And I guess <coughs> part of our challenge was, you know, we had a very, very young team. They used to working with open source technologies and tools. They used to doing things on their Macs. They used to playing with different libraries and different modules and be able to enable these modules as and when because there's a, there's a perceived time to value benefit and they're wanting that flexibility. A brand like Channel 4 that has reputational risk, that has technology risk, looks at these things slightly differently. Um, so for us as a team, one of the things we did very, very early on is um, when we recruited, we, we made sure that we recruited from outside of our sector. <laughs> the reason for that was twofold. Firstly, we wanted to be able to ask two slightly mundane questions. Why is it you do what you do the way you do it? And pose the question, what if you did this differently? And the reason we recruited explicitly from outside of the sector um, was because we wanted the license to be able to ask those questions. The reason we recruited so heavily through the graduate program 
was because the benefit you have of not being tarnished or seeing or having preconceived ideas about how things are done in organisations. So our graduates are able to ask those questions and able to pose those questions in our business and kind of almost challenge what we do. Um, so because we've recruited and we, we looked for profiles like this, it immediately meant that we would adopt uh, and operate slightly differently. So from a data science perspective, often it's about the art of the possible. Uh, so looking at different things that perhaps Amazon or AWS are releasing and sort of saying, actually, how do we use that, what that, what that might mean, uh, or other open source libraries. It meant that we would build lots and lots and lots of proof of concepts, uh, because if you could get a proof of concept built, minimal viable product, get it into the business, get someone using it, they kind of get it, because often when you do things on PowerPoint, it's all a bit conceptual to an editor or a cr someone in the creative side of the business. They kind of need to use it, they need to touch it, feel it, play with it, and then they kind of get what you're meaning when you're talking about an optimization engine or a recommendation system. Um, for us, it's about speed and agility. Because so much is changing in the open source community, so much is changing in terms of our links with academia, our data science team are often really keen to onboard those applications because they're, they're able to kind of find something that's happening in the open source community and link it back to a business application. So they're eager to bring things in constantly. Finally, often they're working with beta technologies or alpha releases of, of technologies. Again, because it gives them an edge and it allows them to explore and experiment far more faster than they could ordinarily if we were to use traditional um, license-based uh, software and solutions. And finally, we're very much incentivized to take risks. So that's, that's the data science landscape, I guess, within Channel 4 and within the team. If we now have a look at the technology side of that equation, it's all very different. It's about security. Uh, it's about scalability. Uh, so suddenly they're having questions about, it's great you've got this open source widget that you want to enable, but how scalable is it? Uh, they're worried about outages. And uh, for us, it's not a big issue, right? So what's the worst that can happen? But they're constantly worried about outages. They're worried about reputational risk. So if the screens were to go dark, what would that mean to our brand? And finally, they have this mindset and they're incentivized to ensure that things don't break. So as you can see, there's a complete divergence of values, attitudes, ways of working, and this caused a phenomenal amount of frustration for our teams. On one hand, they knew the answer was possible. Uh, when they talk to their peers, they're hearing about what other organizations and startups are doing. Uh, we often read about some of the tech digital giants, what they're doing, the speed which they're able to innovate, and how they're able to pivot their businesses. And then they're internally faced with some of these challenges. So I think that caused a lot of frustration. Resignation. So moving on from there, for those of you who haven't seen it, Black Mirror, uh, there's a particular scene in the season one uh, where you kind of accept this is how it is. Um, and I guess for our team, what that meant was there's, there's a lot of value in disrupting and agitating a business process or a technology team that are well-established that use traditional techniques and technologies. But there comes a point in time when you realize the only way you can be successful in the organization is if you look at finding a common middle ground. So our team had to flex a little and perhaps not use as high-risk embryonic open source modules. Equally, technology had to kind of flex a little bit. And we kind of got to a point in this phase where we spend a lot more time sort of looking at how can we meet in the middle a bit more. Uh, and make huge compromises. So for example, uh, some of the work we did with um, uh, on our commercial team, we created new advertising products. It meant that granted the approach might take it too long to develop, because it meant that the team, once they developed it, it could be operationalized from the technology side of things a lot faster. So those are some of the compromises we had to make uh, as a team. But it's frustrating because if you're a 20 something in a business, you're hearing all these different exciting things you can use, you're hearing the speed at which you could deploy these things, and you're having to sort of almost slow down a little bit. Um, and that's the challenge we've had in our team in terms of how do you bring those two things together? How do you, on the one hand, embrace agility and all the disruptive sort of influence that the, this talent can bring to us uh, and ensure that you're not complacent and you're not too accepting of traditional organizations? But on the other hand, just the practical realities of being successful and being able to create value within the organizations that our teams work in. Finally, acceptance. Um, so I guess um, where we've come through now is um, kind of going through all those different phases as I talked about, is how do we now start to um, credentialize what we've done uh, and uh, create more of a pool. So I think up until now, 
it was very much a push from data science. So we would go into the business, come up with ideas, work with stakeholders, uh, influence, position, cajole, bribe over lunches and everything else. So we try a whole host of techniques. Um, but what happened part way through is um, we had our first ad product that we developed. Um, and data science team could prove the accuracy of these models. They could use uh, rock curves, that, for those of you data scientists, that can, can prove how efficient these products are. They could uh, statistically verify that these, these products we were developing were 99.9% .9 accurate. It didn't matter. Ad sales wouldn't believe us. Uh, so we had to do a couple of things, actually. Firstly, we had to get an independent organization to verify that the things we were building were of the quality we were claiming them to be. So we had to hire in uh, a big five uh, audit firm that did that. But that wasn't enough either. We had to then actually trial the product with some advertisers, where advertisers were willing to pay a premium on this new product. And then we had to use traditional research techniques. Can you imagine data science then using traditional research? Uh, to really understand if the new ad products that we were developing uh, would deliver incremental spontaneous recollection and uh, improved recall metrics. So these are very classic kind of traditional metrics that are used in advertising to understand does this ad product cut through more effectively than any other ad product. Uh, so you have to do a trial of that as well. Once we get results from that, in combination with the audit, that's when the product gets opened. Because suddenly, our ad sales team realized that they had a new product that was more effective and efficient for advertisers and brands. Brands were willing to pay a premium for, and there was a yield increase in terms of our revenue. So we were able to lift revenue commercially. What this also meant was within about three to two and a half years, we went from a cost function in our business to a profit making function. So we're now a profit centre within China 4. By profit, we don't know if we can generate profits, but it means we can generate more revenue that goes back into our program. So once that happens, uh, like I said, the blood gets open. We developed more and more commercial ad products. Ad sales wanted more and more of our time. But because ad sales were realising that benefit, the rest of the business suddenly stood up and said, hang on a minute, you're doing that for ad sales, what can you now do for us? And that was a massive pivot for us because it shifted the conversation and the debate from our data science team going out and pushing and selling ideas to almost the floodgates of people coming in and asking, what can you do for us, what can you do for us, and us having to furiously prioritize and think about where there would be value. Uh, and finally, you know, we continue the commercial innovation as well, and we've then branched out into things like recommendations, personalization. Um, the second thing that happens very, very early as well after we developed some of these ad products, we got numerous awards for the work that we were doing. A lot of this is because if you look at um, all the different sectors and industries, it's fair to say that media and broadcasting were probably quite late to the data game, uh, in that if you're a bank, you've written, you typically have you know, credit risk analysts, you have um, statistical capabilities within the organization, perhaps not using the data science aspects of it, but certainly you're familiar with that skill set. In media, it, the skill set just didn't exist anywhere. Uh, the technologies just didn't exist. So it was very, very different for our organization. And I think once we got accredited and we got um, awards from both uh, research organization, computing organizations, uh, marketing week, I think that then helped credentialize uh, and create greater opportunities for our team, which I think from a, a values perspective and a cultural perspective, again, created that reinforcement. The second thing that happened is uh, we started hearing more and more from international broadcasters that started to reach out and said, look, we've heard about what you're doing with data. We're seeing some of the benefits and we're reading about it. What have you done? How have you done it? And can you come over and help us? So we started to engage more collaboratively with other broadcasters to understand what we can do collectively to start to bring about this change in the industry that brings in data science talent into a very, very creative organization and a creative sector. And then lastly, commitment. Uh, and that's very much where we are today. And I think it's fair to say uh, where we started was very much uh, data science playing the role of an agitator. Uh, of creating the art of the possible. And where we are today is we sit now side by side with other parts of our business, such as technology, such as ad sales, uh, such as product, and we co-develop some of these ideas. So everything from the first kind of ideation of what if we did this, what if we did that, is co-developed. And then as we go through the proof of concept, and then finally creating and realizing the value, it, all of those teams work now side by side, collectively, to create that, which then means we don't have as many of these, I guess, failed products because we're getting the business to confirm how they might use it. They're committing to what changes they might make. They're working with our data science team uh, to then develop some of these products. 
um, and they're understanding how the bringing together the kind of, I guess, the art and the science creates a better outcome for our business uh, and a better product in terms of how we can then start to embrace data science uh, and realize value from, from data science within our own business. So I guess to summarize, um, going back to when we first started, uh, when we were in a slight state of shock, uh, it was very much what, how I'd attribute this is, is really understanding how you play that game of chess. So it's understanding the landscape. It's understanding the different stakeholders in your business. It's investing time in building those relationships. And it's investing time to understand what moves you need to make with what departments, how and when, in order to get everything to kind of line up and into place. Denial, very much all around um, how do you navigate through the organization, but crucially, how do you empathize with the individual you're talking to on the other side of the desk, who, for example, has been doing something a certain way within the context of a traditional business for a number of years, and suddenly is having a very different conversation. Uh, so the first thing that comes to mind is, you know, is my job safe? The things you're talking about, automation and all these different things, does that mean I'm out of a role? So it's empathizing with those individuals within the business to understand where have they come from, what are their challenges, and how do you create something that helps them in the role that they're in, rather than overtly the, the robotic process automation aspects of things. Anger, though on the one hand you could look at that and say, well actually that's not, that's not conduct, uh, conducive for a business, I think one of the key things it did is it helped us disrupt our model, uh, and it helped us rethink our operating model as an organization. Because for the first time there was a function in Channel 4 that was probably slightly more technically uh, savvy than the rest of the wider business that could then almost pose and challenge how we were doing things technically, but could uh, help our technology team start to embrace newer techniques and methodologies and, and development. And I think that was a useful kind of catalyst of change for us as a business. Resignation, I think we, we started to realize that actually, once you've kind of agitated, how do you start to bring it all together? How do you start to work more collaboratively? Because at the end of the day, the role we play, you know, we can't realize that value. Unless we get the business to do something differently and we get technology teams to automate it, we, we are literally sitting stuck in the middle. Uh, so for us, that was really key, that if we couldn't unlock those two streams, we were never going to realize value. Um, acceptance. I think this was all around um, diversity and diversity of thought. So I talked a little bit around why we recruited from outside of the sector and why we specifically recruited um, graduates. It's bringing in that um, external thinking, that external perspective. And one of the, the great benefits of having the graduates in the channel is that they're able to tap into peers that are in other organizations and bring in other ideas. Um, they're equally able to get out and understand how other organizations are, are solving some of these problems and some of these challenges that we wouldn't ordinarily see. So I think as many of you that, that are experienced hires, you tend to go to a lot of the, these industry events where you meet more and more of the same people in the same sector, in the same industry. And it's all sort of revolving doors because they all sort of move around and, you know, you see, I 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 and it helps us understand where we can create value, where we ordinarily wouldn't have thought would be value to be created. And finally, uh, commitment. Um, I think the big win here was all around how do we get different parts of our organization thinking about a common outcome. Uh, and that can be anything from increasing the number of video on demand views that are going to happen this month, next week, this year, or driving uh, commercial innovation which is gonna drive up our commercial revenues. Equally, creative innovation is all around how do you personalize the experience for all four such that viewers come back in a much more um, engaged state. Uh, and when we understand the landscape against something like a Netflix, for example, you realize very quickly that consumer expectations are going up. Uh, it's no longer acceptable to deliver products and services and experiences that aren't personalized. And that's quite a challenge for us given we're a, quite a traditional um, broadcast one-to-many kind of uh, you know, organization and we're very quickly trying to adopt and understand how do you tailor that on a one-to-one -one basis and what does that mean for our business model. Uh, so on that note, I will open up to any questions. Thank you very much.
thank you very much, Sanjeev. And uh, I thought that was an amazing uh, example of a journey of embedding data science within a very successful and interesting organisation. So um, now we're going to take some questions. I should introduce myself first as well. I'm Joshua Ryan Sahar, and I'm uh, uh, working for Data Lab, and I'm going to sort of guide you through today. So while you're thinking of questions, I'm going to do facilitator's privilege and ask a question first, if you don't mind. Um, and I want to know about how you help your team grow, because we know data science is a fast-moving field, and uh, what is your approach to training your data scientists within your team? So I think we've, we've realised there's almost, um, I guess, two tracks for our data scientists. One is sort of moving more towards um, into the business, uh, so that's the data strategist role. Uh, so that's where data scientists will spend a bit more time with our data strategists. Uh, they're increasingly engaging directly with the business, and they're sort of exploring what does that look like they want to go down that trajectory which sort of almost rounds them as data scientists. The second route is more what we call kind of leaning more into technology. So, for example, the classic kind of DevOps, Dev engineering type roles, mm -hmm. um, there's opportunities there where we're starting to work clo more closely with technology so that some of our data scientists are preferring to do the, the pipeline, the DevOps, the Dev engineering, and that's the other path they're potentially looking to, to kind of formulate. I, I would say that it's still, we're still not there yet uh, in terms of there's still challenges and differences between teams. But that's certainly the aspiration in terms of creating a two-path trajectory for our data science teams. Thank you very much. So, uh, are there any questions in the audience? I have lots. So, uh, okay, we'll go to you at the front. Could you mention your name just as you ask a question? Yeah, hi, Sanjeevin. Uh, J Jason um, from BBC, so I feel your pain. <laughs> a lot of what you're saying really tallies. Um, I'm just interested in what you're saying in bringing in skills from other uh, industry sectors. And um, I was interested which industry sectors you thought brought some, you know, new ideas from the data science perspective, you know, retail, banking, any sort of ones that you could call out and sort of ideas that they were bringing in? Yeah, absolutely. So um, retail was a big one for us uh, because uh, the way we saw that problem statement was, was if you think about a traditional retailer, um, what products go on what shelf in the store is fundamentally an optimization problem. When you think about how we schedule linear TV, finite number of hours, set of content assets, how do you optimize what content goes when and where is fundamentally an optimization problem. So that's one example we've brought that in. Um, the other's been around um, airlines in terms of how they think about yield-based pricing and when, you're, uh, when demand is high for a particular seat, for a particular route, how they start thinking about optimizing pricing. That carries over into how we think about ad sales on the commercial side of our business, uh, where you have finite supply, uh, sort of demand that flexes, how do you think about dynamic pricing uh, methods and what does that look like? So those are two examples where we've specifically looked at um, use cases in business processes that map over uh, in generic terms into our own business and think about how do we, how do we start to pioneer some of those things. Just one uh, quick comment. Um, do, does loyalty and retention, does that, is that something that you focus very much on? Is so we, we started on that um, sort of four or five years ago and I think what we realized was because the relationship with us is quite a, um, an emotive kind of relationship, it's not, it's not sort of a transactional relationship like um, retail points programs, we felt that um, going overtly down that route wouldn't quite work for our audience. And when we researched it, we found the same thing, that they, they felt it odd that they would get incentivized to get a couple of points to watch this, and what would they do with the points, and it became quite confusing. Um, where we've migrated to is much more around how do you deliver a brand experience, and what is that brand experience like? Um, and we've created sort of a almost like a light reward scheme, which is all around um, extending the media brand experience. So for example, being able to spend time with Alan Carr or um, coming backstage while we're doing a filming. So it's extending kind of the, the TV experience in how we've brought together other experiences that are like that. And that's as far as we've taken it at the moment. Okay, uh, any other questions? I think we'll just have one over there. Is it okay just wait for the microphone? Oh, sorry. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name's John, I'm a software development student. Um, I was just wondering, how did you overcome the resistance to change? Did you manage to put together a strategy to, to deal with that going uh, forward? Yeah, so a lot of it, um, so we, we did about two or three things. Firstly, we had top-down exec buy-in. So David, our CEO, was very much, very publicly saying data is the new oil. Uh, if a broadcaster doesn't have a data strategy, it's like a submarine without sonar. So he was very, very public about a lot of these things. That helped. Um, second thing was finding um, sort of individuals within these different functions that were willing to kind of give it a go, uh, could see the landscape around them changing and really wants to be part of the, the, new, the new rather than kind of holding on to the old. And then thirdly, it was the um, having commercial success. And once we had that, 
that became a catalyst for change for our organization. Okay, so we have time for one or two more questions. We have one just uh, at the back there, Perry. Oh, uh, hi there, Perry Gibson, uh, student of informatics. Um, so you say that you want to get the data scientist exploring lots of different areas of the business once they started looking at advertising, different departments were interested in what they were doing, but what are you doing to ensure that the data scientists are getting exposure to like things that are happening outside your business? Are you creating spaces for them to like go to training events and that sort of thing? Yeah, so what we've done historically is they, they'll go to um, Rexis and some of those sort of bigger industry events, historically is what we've done. Um, and then increasingly we have a, um, sort of like a training day the data science team do sort of every couple of weeks um, and we're starting to extend that program out to start to um, onboard other organizations within that so we can for example have uh, data scientists within print media coming in and collectively working on a problem um, the third thing they also do is they sort of do these hackathon days mini hack days um, where they're it's an internal kind of run initiative we've only done I think two of them so far oh four okay four of them so far um, but we're looking to do more of those and that helps um, sort of co-mingle that skill set um, and then lastly the links to academia have been quite useful um, but I think we've found it's always quite an interesting um, path to navigate in terms of aligning a business objective and outcome with an academic kind of uh, sort of piece of work and how do you best bring those two worlds together and I think that's always a bit of a challenge that we've, we've grappled with but that's the other way we've kind of enabled that as well. well thank you. Okay I think we've probably got time for one last question. Um, so, does anyone else want to ask a question? If not, I'll just ask one final one if that's okay. Um, I thought uh, it was particularly interesting around the journey you took to get by and it has already been discussed. Did you ever consider, um, I know there's a lot of debate around embedded teams or standalone data science teams, did you ever consider going into embedded teams and if you decided not to, why was that? So we started centralised uh, because, and the way we're structured is we report directly to the CEO. Uh, so it gave us remit to look across the entire organization. Um, I think as we developed and grow, I think there's certainly a debate to be had around do you then decentralize that model? And in fact, uh, Amy, uh, who's just finished the one year of the graduate program, well, the, the next month she comes back into the channel is then gonna do a secondment into one of the other functions. So that's how we started to look at that. Uh, we feel at the moment though, we're not quite ready to fully decentralize, um, but it's definitely a, a cycle where you're going to decentralize, then recentralize again. So I think we're, we're not there yet, but it's certainly an area we're looking at. Okay. Well, can I just ask everyone to give another round of applause for what was a fantastic talk? Thank you. Okay, so we just heard a, a, a really great talk about how data science is embedded in, in the media sector. Uh, and I think uh, there's many other sectors in which data science is starting to, to grow. So I'm really delighted to now to be able to introduce Sarah Blair from Thornton's Law in Dundee, who's going to talk a little bit about artificial intelligence and data science in the legal sector. So welcome up on stage. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, that's a hard act to follow. That was great to hear. Um, my name's Sarah Blair, I'm the director of IT at Thornton's. Um, Thornton's is a full sector legal firm operating out of 10 locations, although we're, we're HQ'd in Dundee, we're right across the, the east coast of Scotland. We've got around 500 people now in the firm. And the services we provide range right from complex corporate transactions, acting for public bodies, um, right down to we'll write your will and we'll sell your house. So it's a, it's, a, it's a really disparate business. And um, just looking, I was given this question today. Um, how is data changing traditional professions? And I think the two important words there are the word changing, because uh, that's, that's a key one, and traditional, because I think actually there's a massive contrast between you know, some of the creative industries, retail, um, things like that, and actually the legal sector itself. But it's also refreshing to hear that there are challenges embedding some of the ethos of data science into a, into a business, even in the creative industries where you think they are you know, they're pioneering these things and, and are ahead of the game. Um, so just thinking about culture, I was sitting listening, um, the demographic of my firm, I'm not sure how it compares. There's probably much more polarized in terms of, of my own data scientist. I have one who we've just recruited on the back of the, the Data Labs um, program. So I have a young graduate data scientist and I work in a partnership. So there are 50 partners in my firm. 
um, and the demographic of them is very different from my graduate scientist, as you can imagine. Um, I was at a session last week, uh, last year, um, uh, a legal tech session, and there is, you know, th there's, there's a legal tech community that, 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 is, that is active now, and Dan Katz is well known in legal tech um, he calls himself a scientist, a technologist, and a law professor. Um, he's behind Lex Machina and some of the work that they've been doing there. And he stood at the British Legal Tech Forum last year and said, legal tech looks like finance looked like 25 years ago. So that gives you some aspect of the contrast between these two discussions, these two talks. Um, I think that's slightly unfair, and I think there has been a, a, a sea change over the last 12 months. But certainly in terms of the culture of, of legal, in, in terms of... of being a traditional profession, it's probably the most traditional that, that I can think of. And there's a number of reasons for that in, in legal. Um, as I say, the, the, there's 50 partners at my firm. They are highly educated, highly intelligent lawyers at the end of the day. These are the specialisms. They're also savvy businessmen, but at the end of the day, tech's not really top of the priority list when it comes to legal. And I think that's starting to change, but the culture certainly is a, is a challenge for, for tech. Um, in that culture as well, you've got a, a profession who are pretty conservative, pretty risk averse. They're highly regulated. Um, they're bound by huge amounts of, of client confidentiality and dealing with lots and lots of, of sensitive data. So really the, the culture there, um, if you think about the, the open source, the sharing, the collaborative nature of data science, it's really um, you know, very difficult for, for, for lawyers to, to kind of embrace because of all these, these reasons. Um, and the other, reason, the other challenge for me is that, that in legal, there's a tradition of, of working to the billable hour. So we've, we've had this, this, um, this idea of, of everything's on the clock, everything's part of the billable hour, and that's been um, prevalent for, for years and years and years in legal. And it's only in the last few years that, that we started to kind of see that change. And so you have to, um, that mentality makes it very tricky to disrupt um, the, the, the thinking in the industry as well. The other challenge that we've had is when you talk to a lawyer about AI, there's been some historical stuff that's tainted their, their kind of thinking around it. Um, in the early days of, of AI, and I'm no AI expert, I will, I will put my hand up and say that now, but certainly the, the early applications in legal were all about expert systems and rule-based artificial intelligence. And that was a real challenge um, in terms of a lot of the data that we deal with in legal is unstructured data, it's all text-based. And obviously, in the days where we didn't have processing power that we have now, um, when we didn't have volumes of data that we have now, and the storage capabilities, really, this is, you know, the, the winter of AI came around on the back of all the, the rules-based stuff um, because of the, the lack of, of data-driven. And on the back of that as well, you've got Richard Susskind, who um, has written many fantastic tomes, um, but in... Uh, 2008, I think the, the first the, one of the books that he released was called The End of Lawyers, and the suggestion was met quite skeptically by legal, um, suggesting that robots were going to come in and, and take over all their jobs, and, and they were going to be outdated and antiquated and what have you. So some of the culture um, and some of the, the, the development of, of AI has been tainted over the years by this approach. But actually, in legal, what we have seen over the last five years or so um, is that Law firms, including my own, have been very good at setting the foundations in place that actually mean that the time is now ripe for change. Um, and some of these foundations are starting to think about data. We're probably late to the party, but we really, you know, the last few years, uh, legal has started thinking about the amount of data that they capture and started with the structured data and the actual data that they're capturing throughout the course of a, of a transaction. Um, and using that data and alongside that automating some of the processes. So there's been lots and lots of movement in the last few years, um, last 10 years around case management and automation and document assembly. But a key part of that is actually that we have a lot of workflow driven um, uh, processes within the firm. We've got that platform of automation there. So actually we're now um, creating much more bodies of data around the workflows that we're doing ourselves. So the structured data that we have is much richer now, it's much more consolidated. We started um, looking into things that, again, were slightly tainted over the years, such as voice recognition, but in the last few years has had a bit of a revolution in legal, 
and actually the technology is, is much cleverer with machine learning built in now, but actually speech recognition is heavily used within my firm and has been for the last couple of years. So talking a little bit about the Thornton story then. Um, as I say, we have some of the foundations in place now, but we are, you know, as I say, we're slightly late to the party. But we do have and have had for about five to eight years a really well-established management information platform. We've had our data consolidated. We're starting to record all of the data around automation and all of, around workflow. And we had um, built lots and lots of things like OLAP cubes that allowed us to build KPIs and dashboards and start to manually derive insights from that data. Um, but a lot of that was manual and over the last few years um, the, the appetite for that data has become deeper and deeper and higher in the firm. Um, the firm started asking more questions of the data. So actually we started looking at different sectors and different work types and looking at actually which work type does give us better margin, which work type does take the longest, which work type does need the more specialist skills alongside it, where are we more successful in tender exercises, who's done the most tenders where we have been successful. Down to a very granular level looking at specific work types, um, we do a lot of personal injury work and personal injury work um, comes through a referrer network and each of the, um, the cases that we take on has a cost attached to it and it has a, a level of attributes attached to it. And on the back of it, we've started asking more and more questions around that data. So we started looking at what is the cost per acquisition per case? What are the success rates of different suppliers? And this has consumed a huge amount of time within the firm over the last few years, where actually we had to outsource all of that work. So we had consultants working on it. We had um, specific bespoke development done on the back of it. And it started to become more costly. The deeper the questions got, the more questions each question generated, the cost of that was very high. And I had a very timely chat with Robin, um, um, probably more than 12 months ago. Uh, we'd started working with a, a couple of firms who were involved in, in data labs in different ways. So I started hearing the data labs mentioned here and there, and actually started um, chatting with Robin about the program and the difference that that might make to the structured data that we were looking to analyze as a firm. So we took on a student of our own this year um, over the summer. And again, I think it was a, a, a bit of a, a baptism of fire there going in. Um, some of the partners in the firm didn't even know what a data scientist would do. So there was a little bit of education there about why we would even take on a placement student to, to look at the data that we were working with. But actually what we found was, um, pretty quickly we were getting lots of attention from the firm. We were able to put um, Mirage, our student, into meetings with stakeholders and talk to them about their data. And whereas they normally come to me and say, right, I, I need to understand you know, how long these cases are taking and should I take on more work from the supplier? And I say, right, give me a week, I'll come back to you, we'll do a report, of, you know, that here's what the cost might be. We were actually starting to answer questions and generate more questions right there in the meetings with, with, the, with the partners themselves about the work that they were doing. And that started getting quite a bit of attention throughout the farm. Um, right up to the last few weeks, um, we're actually just been looking at um, some of the techniques. Um, now I'm going to go out alone here and say um, I'm reliably informed who's using RStudio, neural network techniques, multiple regressions. But actually what we were starting to look at was deeper analysis of the data, faster and quicker analysis of the data and actually looking at some of the trends and insights of that data um, with visualization that we've never had before, being able to do it on the fly, being able to do it really, really quickly. I know all of you are looking at me and going, right, okay, this is, this is something that in a firm like ours we didn't have access to before, and it started to make a massive amount of difference. So actually what we've built now is um, a predictive model using the data science for this particular type of work. Um, and actually that's going to, to um, be a decision support tool for the, for the case handlers in this type of work. Um, and we'll bring an enormous amount of, of business support to the work that we're doing. So what does the, what does the future look like for legal now? We're, we've started to, to, to kind of go on this journey a little bit more, but the future actually because of data and because of data-driven AI looks very different for, for legal. You could argue that some of the stuff that we've done over the summer is really about being more efficient, it's about doing things more quickly and more accurately. 
And that's where some of the data driven AI and legal is really going to start to make a difference. What we've started thinking about is um, automating the routine, automating the tasks in legal, and, and really we're starting to see a huge amount of that um, come through already. It used to be um, that this kind of um, AI and these kinds of applications were really in the hands of the, the bigger magic circle firms who had much deeper pockets, who had in-house development teams. But actually over the, the last 12 months, we've started to see a big difference where actually you, you can pay to use some of these services. So actually in, in the, the allocation of natural language processing, um, because a huge amount of our data is text, so actually you start to throw some of the unstructured data in there and start to look at text analysis, there is a huge amount of opportunity there now. And a lot of firms that we are talking to offer a pay-as-you-use subscription. You don't have to develop this type of technology in-house. So it's, there's massive opportunities to work with these firms and now to work with our own data scientists on the opportunities that might offer. And some of the obvious, uh, some of you um, have probably read about this, these are, these are the applications now that actually we're starting to see make a difference in legal and starting to explore ourselves for opportunities of the firm. So contract review, reading huge amounts of test, um, text and offering up an oversight of that text really, really quickly. Starting to actually look at patterns and an overall anomalies in the text. Um, due diligence and, and other kind of um, an elegantly called grunt work in legal can now be automated using some of these techniques. Um, legal research, reading huge amounts of, of legal data, which, um, and then turning that into knowledge within the firm to offer up um, information to the lawyer in a way that is what they need very, very quickly is something that's coming through now. And predictive systems, we, you know, we've looked at that for our own structured data, and I think that's just one small opportunity that's, that's just gonna start to make a massive difference. But already these, these types of systems are, are really coming through. Lex Machina, um, we've talked about, and there's a huge amount of other ones. We're actually um, feeding in the, the data you get actionable insights using the technology. Um, and then intelligent interfaces is, a, is an interesting one as well. Um, this is again back to, this is what Dan Katz calls a, a, a modern version of the rules-based logic, a modern version of the expert, whereas you have the same type of interface and the, the, the rules-based system, but actually having natural language processing and machine learning behind it, there will come huge opportunities for it to make a difference. So we're starting to see in legal chatbots, we're starting to see in legal the do not pay bot, which is actually offering an access to justice way of, 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 of offering legal services. And we're starting to see um, triage. Um, so a couple of these that are starting to disrupt, the, the, the do not pay chatbot was all to do with parking fines. But as of this week, you'll see that actually um, they're now just converted the technology to offer the, the, the ability to, um, to look at the Equifax data breach and work out whether you have a claim and step you through that claim very, very quickly. Robot lawyer Lisa is something that's come out this, um, this year. Um, Chrissy Lightfoot is very active in legal tech and has put together Robot Lawyer Lisa for non-disclosure agreements. But actually, as an opportunity for legal, that's an interesting one because it's an expert system with machine learning behind it. But actually, it will tell you whether your non-disclosure agreement is actually suitable for Robot Lisa or actually it fronts up a legal service where the humans are actually doing the, the service. They're, they're, they're offering a higher level of expertise. So it's triaging the work. Um, and taking some of the, the more routine stuff and doing it free, but actually that then is a, as an opportunity to upsell other legal services on the back of it and more, um, more sophisticated legal services on the back of it. This is what legal tech looks like now. Um, I would say that Dan Katz you know, was a bit unfair because actually in the last 12 months, most of the, a huge amount of these systems are, have now emerged. It's still early days, I would say, and the, and the sector itself is, um, is ready for the change, and they say they're open to the change, but actually engaging lawyers is, is a challenge, and, and this is where we need to look at um, how we can actually start to um, use some of this technology. And it, really, the, 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 the application of our own data science was to, to kind of do things faster and better, and essentially cheaper than outsourcing the work and using a consultancy. And that's much of where some of the opportunity in legal is now. So actually taking some of the, the grunt work 
um, away from, from the, the tired junior paralegals that, that you see often talked about and taking that work and automating it and using data-driven AI to actually do that work means that actually we can start to focus our client services um, for the higher value, deliver more value services for the client, actually deliver more value by delivering more efficient services to our client, but actually that means that we need to look at our own model of pricing quite a bit and actually work with our clients on how we price our services around some of these technologies. And I think that's where the cultural change is a bit more of a challenge in legal. It's very traditional around the, the, the billable error, as I say. The other thing that, um, you know, using some of these technologies is, is showing innovation and, and working with our clients on opportunities. So in legal, I would say, you know, I, t I talk to um, the partners in our firm and some of them say, yeah, we need to be doing some of that AI. And I talk to some of them and say, oh, that's, that's not really something that we should be doing just now. But actually, when you can actually give them examples of where it's making a difference, um, that's when you start to see that, that actually there is a real um, use case for it at the moment. And I think we're, we, if we can start to think a bit differently as a firm, um, we can actually start to, to offer services um, that, that really will do drive value. Um, I was just going to say, as, as a legal firm, it is more of a challenge. But actually, one of the things we can do as well is to, is to participate in communities like this. I think it's made, it's made an enormous amount of difference to, to our own firm. Um, we talked a bit about engaging stakeholders, and I think that's where I've started to see a real difference. So engaging some of the, the younger lawyers, engaging some of the trainees in my firm has had a massive difference and looked at these opportunities. But engagement outside legal, I think, is really important. And the, the Data Labs community has been fantastic, both from looking at data science and actually looking at some of the things that are going on now. Um, we're starting to see legal hackathons taking place, and Richard Susskind um, himself organized um, a court hackathon a couple of weeks ago down south. Um, there's a, a blockchain hackathon in a couple of weeks looking at, at, at legal applications there. So I think participating in this community and being inspired by a community that is so open and collaborative and sharing is something that's quite tricky for legal to do, but actually if we can do that, I think it will start to, to bring up the pace of, of, of change and bring us closer to that 25-year um, lag that, that Dan Katz said. That's me. Thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. I thought that was uh, really interesting. It's great news that with Data Lab and MBN are helping uh, Fortins get on the sort of innovative journey as well. I gave a little yelp of delight when I found out you'd recruited off the back of uh, yeah, the absolutely. scheme as well. So that's yeah. brilliant news. Um, so, is there any questions from the audience? If not, I've got a couple already lined up. Okay, so the front there. Hi, uh, Mike Spencer from uh, Scotland's Royal College. I was wondering how you reconcile the two hats of uh, the traditional IT saying no and let's be safe and data science and being disruptive. It's, it's tricky anyway, as we've heard um, earlier on for, for a creative industry. It's, it's very tricky in, in legal. Not only do you have the, the, the constraints around it, but then you have the, the risk averse and conservative culture as well. I think the the key is to, to find the right balance of these things and try and engage the business in where the opportunities are, but not get too caught up in the, in the, in, in the legals of it. I, in my firm, even negotiating supplier contracts is difficult because you have to take it to one of your own lawyers and actually you know, get them to review it and you're stuck in it for three weeks. So it, it's trying to open minds a little bit and um, to kind of use inspiration from outside legal for these opportunities. Um, and actually bring that conversation back in. Um, but then, you know, we have, we have a, obviously a, direct, a director of risk management. We are very keen on information security. So we have some of the, the same constraints. And it's about just finding the right balance between the two, I think, in, in legal that's, that, that's tricky. Um, certainly with my, um, my own kind of role within the firm, it's, it's trying to, to find the right conversations to, to have, the right levels of those conversations. Um, and to, to get lawyers not to think like lawyers for a little bit so that they can kind of see opportunity in a slightly different way. Okay, any other questions from the audience? So I have a quick question, um, which is, uh, you've of course successfully recruited, um, and would you have any advice for any data scientists from the audience who are potentially going into the legal profession or other 
traditional professions as to how they can uh, approach a, a different culture? I, so I think um, be prepared to challenge, I think, is, is the one that I, you know, I, I would definitely say. Um, it's even, even our own student coming in, learning about the business takes quite a bit of time, but actually don't learn about the business as is. Be prepared to come in and, and actually ask lots and lots of questions um, and challenge the way that we're doing things and challenge the, the, the data that we're seeing. Um, but be prepared to have many, many of those conversations <laughs> to, to find out where those opportunities are and to speak, the, you know, to learn about the culture and the language of the firm. Um, and establishing relationships both inside and outside the firm, I think, is, is really, really important. Um, bringing inspiration in, for me, has, has been massive this last year from, from other industries, from the young people that we've been working with, from the, the, the third party suppliers that we've been working with. Um, so I think, that, you know, have the right conversation, be prepared to challenge um, and be inspiring, I think, are, are, are tips there. Thank you very much. Uh, any further questions? We have just two there. We get to fair. Oh. Well, hi there. Um, hi. Martina from Wolsey here. Um, it's great to hear that even like traditional professionals are getting into data science. I guess my question is: uh, I understand that it's like a hard buy for people in the legal professions to, to acquire this sort of mentality. I wonder whether AI is also like feels like it's people feel threatened, like lawyers, do they feel threatened, like am I gonna be replaced by a chatbot? What's, what's the reception? I, th I think there's definitely a, an element of the unknown there. I don't know whether it's a, you know, a lot of the Susskind writing, the, the top line headlines are that robots are going to come over and take over an antiquated set of professions. But actually, if you read them carefully, you know, um, Richard Susskind is just telling us that we have to think differently, we have to work differently, and we have to be prepared to embrace technology. Um, so I think that, you know, it's, it, it's those types of, of, if you read between the lines, you can see carefully that we're not saying we're looking to replace jobs. And that's a conversation I've been having, um, not quite at that level, but really looking for opportunities to support and deliver higher value work to the lawyers, so actually this, you know, the, the routine stuff that we can look to automate with, with natural language processing and machine learning is stuff, as I say, it's the, it's the tired paralegals, it's the junior clerks, it's the, you know, that's the type of work that actually, I hear, I hear it called the grunt work, that actually we're looking to automate. So when you, you are able to articulate that and look for opportunities to do that, I think it then realizes, you can then articulate that it's an augmentation of the legal services, the profession, the highly skilled, intelligent um, services that we offer, but using technology in a clever way so we can offer that a better value for our client and we can offer it more efficiently and we can compete in a market that's starting to be disrupted and started to change. So it's, that conversation is, is, is important to educate that, that it's, not, you know, it's, it's not a threat, it, it, it really is a, a compliment, it's an opportunity but, and if we don't embrace it, which I think a lot of firms that, that I speak to at, at the mid-tier, um, even some of the, the bigger magic circle firms, um, if we don't embrace it, then actually we might become you know, a victim of it and we might become the, um, the antiquated, outdated lawyers that, 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 that some people thought Susskind, uh, Susskind suggested that we were going to be. So. Okay, um, I think we've got one last question just to the front. Um. Hi there, uh, my name is Athanasius Kitsios. Uh, the question I have is if there is a risk perceived by yourselves um, uh, with regards to the new legislation that's coming and is always following the development that you have already um, uh, performed. And um, do, you think, do you think there's a risk of changing anything that has been developed already? And if it is a risk, how are you gonna go about it? So if I'm understanding your question, you're talking about the, 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 the pace of change in legislation. So the new legislation is coming with data protection. Uh, GDPR? Yes. yes. And is there any risk of actually changing something that has been developed? developed and implemented internally? Already, yes. Um, I, GDPR, I wasn't going to talk about GDPR. That was my <laughs> challenge of today was to stand up, talk about data and not talk about GDPR in the same breath. But uh, if you do want to know about GDPR, there are a couple of expert lawyers on the Thornton stand um, who can answer lots and lots of your questions. Um, GDPR is a whole different concern. And I think there is a good possibility it's going to disrupt some of the things that we've implemented in my firm um, because of the, 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 the change in, in obligations that, that, that it's going to put on. But 
I don't think we can understand that without doing the, you know, the data mapping exercises and actually understanding the data flow and where the data is going and then having the, 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 the conversations about the risks that are attached to that and making sure we can meet our obligations. So I think, yes, there is a risk, but there's a risk actually that um, some of the services I'm consuming right now in, in our firm are not going to be GDPR compliant and we're going to have to pressurise the suppliers themselves to, to um, not only you know, tell us that they are GDPR compliant but actually to change their products because we need to do things differently. We need to um, be able to, to look at the right to be forgotten. We need to be able to you know, look at our reporting. Um, so actually the, there is a really good chance that established products are not going to meet, you know, cut the mustard. So yes, anything developed in-house I think needs to be looked at alongside other systems. Um, I don't think there's necessarily a greater risk. I think the volume of big data around, um, around data science might prove some slightly unique challenges around, around GDPR. But again, if it, it, you know, GDPR is not brand new. Data protection has been around for a while. It just raises the bar. So if data protection has been there in the design of these systems originally, then actually, hopefully, some of the fundamentals will will mean that you, you're not having to rip anything out and actually replace anything fundamentally. Okay, well thank you very much. I think that's all the time we've got. So can I just ask for another round of applause for what was a great talk. Okay, it's workshop time. So now, uh, hopefully, you would have uh, registered uh, when you came in. But if you haven't registered, when you go upstairs, you're able to register just at the desk. So the first workshop we have is with Amy from Channel 4, who is on the graduate scheme, as uh, has already been described. Um, so you can register for that uh, uh, and join Amy. The second one is with Ian. Uh, Ian Swanston from Closers, who has uh, got a great workshop around building your professional brand. And then the final one is with Jenny O'Hagan from Glasgow City Council, uh, another organisation took on a lot of graduates this year, who's going to talk a bit about continuous professional learning. So just to sort of uh, summarise, uh, thank you very much for listening for the start. Uh, we now have his workshop. You can go upstairs, register, and they'll point you to the rooms you need to go to. So can I just have us for one more round of applause for our great speakers this morning? Okay. Uh, so, I'm Amy, uh, I'm a graduate data scientist at Channel 4, as previously mentioned, and I'm really going to be talking about the graduate scheme itself at Channel 4. So, kind of what I do day to day, what it's been like, and the research projects that myself and the other graduates have been doing, as they're really kind of indication of the industry academic uh, partnership that we've been trying to foster. So, um, the graduate scheme itself, like what is it? So about three years ago, Channel 4 started to try and build up a relationship with UCL. So UCL is University College London. Um, as most of you probably know, they're one of the top research universities in the world. And particularly their computer science department is very strong. So this took the form of a part-time PhD funded by Channel 4. Uh, and that was in the, in the embodiment of Andrew, who's now still part of our team. Afterwards, we opened up another position for a part-time PhD. And over the success of this, and uh, following on from what Sanjeevan talked about, really developing from a bottom-up structure of uh, helping to create a data science department, uh, we started an MRES project. So I was part of this MRES, uh, MRES program that uh, Channel 4 started in their graduate program. So previously, uh, people had come in as graduates to Channel 4, pretty much straight from uni or from work, and they'd really just started in the department and uh, kind of got very hands-on. Whereas this approach was really kind of actually giving us the tools to, uh, the tools behind the, the data science, so really learning kind of the theory behind it. So the MRES that we learned was, or we, we studied, was uh, web science and big data analytics, which I'm sure you're all used to kind of buzzwords in the industry now that don't seem to explain anything. Um, we, uh, it's basically just a crash course in machine learning. So it really taught us things like language processing, computer vision, uh, the fundamentals of, uh, say, for example, supervised learning that we need to be able to uh, use in our jobs. So Sanjeevan's already shown you this, but he missed himself off of the diagram, so I thought I'd just add it in. Just uh, So you see the, the overview, and as Sanjeevan points out, we're actually mostly students or graduate students, and anyone in blue has either just finished their MRes, as I have, uh, or they're still doing their PhDs, uh, or, as we very excitedly have just started 
three new MRes students have just started this week. So we have the new batch of graduates coming through after the success of this year, partnering with UCL. So my year was the first year we did this MRes program, and there were four of us. And part of the advantage of the MRes program is really being able to uh, recruit from people from all different backgrounds and pools. So we all have very different specialisations from our undergrad degrees. So Ben, he actually was kind of more tailored to the job. So he studied computer science previously uh, with a master's in machine learning and AI. Georgie studied uh, economics. I did bioengineering and Ruan studied electronic engineering. So you can see that we all actually don't come from what you consider a traditional necessarily data science background. But being able to study the MRes really gave us Able, able, enabled us all to come up to the same level to be able to start doing the job. So what do our lives look like when we're at Channel 4? So obviously half of our time is really spent at UCL, you know, doing the traditional student things where we go to lectures, we regret going to lectures, we then <laughs> set our exams and we do our theses. But when we're at Channel 4, we're also doing actual physical work on the data products. So, say for example, things like demo targeting that uh, Sanjeev and previously mentioned, is we're actually getting to put, uh, get stuck in and work with the team. And so we've already started um, really kind of tentatively putting our, our, our handprints on, on, on the work that's done at Channel 4. Um, part of it's a juggling act. So it would be... Uh, it'd be looking through the world through very stinted glasses if we didn't say it was sometimes difficult to balance the time. Uh, we both, Channel 4 and UCL, have different expectations of both what we should be doing, different time schedules, so deadlines obviously for UCL all kind of come at one particular time of the year, whereas Channel 4 work is more throughout the whole year continuous. So it's kind of really having to communicate between these two parties and uh, make an agreement about what's important, what's our priorities, really what should we be working towards. And that also came down um, when we're doing the theses as well, because obviously what Channel 4 to consider to be uh, interesting or important results um, for the research work isn't necessarily what the researchers thought was interesting or important. Uh, part of our day-to-day -day is also doing things as a team. So every week we have things such as the lab meetings, so this involves one person from our team presenting to the rest of the team. So this has been part of the idea that some people mentioned in terms of you know, trying to keep a finger on the pulse of what other, other businesses are doing or what's going on in research as well. So this can range from somebody presenting a paper that they read and they found interesting, uh, talking about general design aesthetics that we should be aspiring to, so say for example test, um, test driven data analysis or test driven software development, or um, talking about ideas and concepts that we've all experienced from our own discipline. So um, say, for example, Georgie, she spoke about behavioral economics, because actually that's becoming quite important to consider within the machine learning algorithms, but it's not something that any of us really have a background in other than her. Um, obviously, most importantly, the selection <laughs> spots, the glamorous side of the job. Um, I have seen Stephen Mangan four times now, um, so uh, it doesn't get old. It's very nice. Um, <laughs> a, a lot of other people aren't as big a fan of Green Wing as I am, so I guess it's not as uh, impressive. But we do have some quite big names, so Orlando Bloom was in the building a few months ago. So there's some, uh, there's some glamour to the data science as well. So I'm going to kind of briefly go over the uh, research projects that me and the other four grads worked on this year. So I'm, trying, I'm going to try not to go too deep Technically, um, if you, any of you have any more questions about it, you can ask me either in the question session afterwards or come up to me, because uh, otherwise it's just going to be a bit dry and dull. Um, so first, Ben's project. Yes, this is what you get in academia, long titles that don't really explain what you're doing and confuse everybody. Um, his thing is basically about subtitles and recommendation engines. So. Uh, recommendation systems for us are really about uh, presenting programs to, to viewers it, that they haven't already seen. So this is an element of personalization that, again, Sanjeevan was mentioning before, but it has some other uses. So obviously, one, it helps increase the viewing figures, which for us is always a benefit, but two, it also helps us really tap into our content and our viewers as well. So being able to see the patterns between what we recommend 
and what people actually watch what we recommend and whether they like what we recommend really helps us kind of see the relationships between our viewers and our content as well. So it's kind of a, a feedback loop basically, not into just the making the recommendations good, but also seeing how we can improve the recommendations themselves. So the way we decide what things to recommend to you is quite a complex thing. There's loads of different features that go into the model. It's not as simple as saying, you like comedy, so let's give you all the comedy programs. Uh, we know that people's tastes are a lot more nuanced than this. One of the most common techniques people use is um, user user filtering. So you say, for example, the first person has watched eight out of 10 cats, peep show, and uh, chewing gum, and I've watched eight out of 10 cats and peep show, the likelihood is I'm also going to like chewing gum. So that's one of the very common ways people make recommendations. However, we have problems when, say, for example, we have a new program that nobody has watched. Like, how do we know, how do we know who's going to like it? It's very hard for us to know just based on uh, information such as genre, um, who really to recommend it to. So Benjamin's solution is looking at subtitles. So subtitles is kind of like an obvious thing, really, for us to be using. We have hundreds of hours of video, almost all of which have subtitles. Um, and so his idea is really that before we even broadcast this program, we can extract the subtitles and get an idea of similar programs or other programs within our itinerary that are, are um, similar in the vocabulary or, or theme. So uh, kind of actually, as was mentioned in, in the law talk, it's quite difficult to just give a computer lots of text. It doesn't, it literally doesn't know what to do with it. And so you have to think about clever ways in order to represent both the sentences and the words. So you have these different word embeddings. So a kind of simplistic version would be if I took a sentence and I said, the cat sat on the mat. And I would just do a frequency count of the words in that sentence. So I'd say the happened twice, cat happened once. And obviously, people have way more complicated ways of representing words and sentences. But the idea is, is that based on the position of words and sentences or the other words that happen to occur with them in the sentence, you can get these kind of quite complex representations of words and uh, map them in some kind of dimensional space. So this is what Ben did with our subtitles, and we got these nice clusters. Uh, so these are um, basically the 24 distinct clusters that Ben was able to extract from our subtitles. And uh, in the little boxes, we have the top five words that um, discriminated between the clusters. So some of the, some of the words are quite strong language. Uh, so it's quite representative of Channel 4, like quite, really quite a diverse um, set of different topics and language style used. So this is interesting because you can definitely see some topics that you get out of these programs. But how, how do we decide whether we've actually been very good at extracting uh, related, pro related programs, basically? So say, for example, if we looked at cluster 11, uh, so that says jungle, brain, extreme, animal, breeding, uh, not as a sentence. And um, from that, we can really tell that it's probably nature programs, documentary, factual. And so this is quite interesting. We, we can then take a genre decomposition of all the different clusters and say, like, have we managed to discriminate and extract? So some of the clusters, say, for example, cluster 12, all that language was very much around um, award ceremonies and things. So we could argue that maybe that's partly because we don't have that many programs in that, in that theme. But then we can see, say, for example, in cluster 11, it's almost entirely factual, the genre decomposition. So we can say that actually we've been pretty good at identifying um, a general theme of program within that cluster. Also of note, it's interesting that factual comes up quite a lot in all the different clusters, which indicates that genre alone is not a very good descriptor of the programs. It's useful to be able to have other different discriminatory features to be able to select and diversify. And being able to discriminate between our programs means that we'll be able to make better recommendations because we can have more nuanced ideas about what people like to watch. So another... Um, project that was involving recommendations was Georgie's. Uh, so ironically, despite the title, it was actually about interpretability. So it's um, really quite a, a more recent idea in machine learning, but actually becoming incredibly important. So 
typically when we had machine learning models, we really just cared about how good it was at predicting stuff. So we fed stuff in, stuff happens in the black box, and we get stuff out. And has it made an accurate prediction? Which is great, but we don't really know why it made that prediction. And typically, the more complex the model, the better for the prediction, but also the harder it was to interpret. I mean, this is particularly poignant in the case of neural nets, where it's a big mass that's very, very difficult for us to understand. So why would we want to learn to interpret it? Surely just having great scores is, is, is the ideal. Well, there's a few reasons. I mean, one, just as a data scientist, it's, it's, an, it's an intellectual ideal to be able to understand why things are happening. Obviously, that's not always possible because things are often represented in very high dimensional spaces. Equally, there's demand from users and legally that people are going to have to start be, to be able to explain the decisions they make. So in the case of Channel 4, it's not as necessary. You know, people aren't going to get upset if we recommend them uh, for in a bed. But people do get upset if you reject their insurance claim. And so it's becoming really important for companies to be able to justify the decisions that their machine le machines make, basically, based on the data that they have of people. And so there's different ways of approaching this. Typically, we don't want to just revert to the most simple, easy model because we lose the accuracy that we've been working towards. So what we do is we kind of have like retrofitting where we try and do stuff to the models and to understand what's happening. So this can come in terms of either changing the inputs we put to the model. So that means that we can see how that affects the outputs and try to make a guess of what's happening uh, in the black box. Sometimes we lift up the lids and say, for example, in the case of convolutional neural nets, we might try to uh, visualize the features that are being, or the convolutional filters that are being formed. Or in Georgie's case, that you can try and build another model on top of your original model and use that as, um, as a method of interpreting your results once you get them. So Georgie was really looking at the idea of making prediction using a quite a complex recommendation model, then taking those predictions and trying to see whether she could explain it with association rules. So association rules, they're, um, I mean, a lot of you probably are quite familiar with them. They're all, they originated really from supermarkets and basket analysis. So it's the kind of question that if I wanted to buy four Jon Snows, it's never enough, uh, how, what is the likelihood I'd also like to buy a David Mitchell? And so you can have this kind of ratios analysis of like, okay, support, how often does Jon Snow ha happen to occur in most people's baskets? That's like a baseline measure of just how popular is Jon Snow. Uh, and then we can look at the confidence. So like, okay, for every time we buy Jon Snow, how often does somebody normally buy a David Mitchell? And then after that, we can go, okay, maybe every time somebody buys a Jon Snow, they buy a David Mitchell. But it turns out that actually everyone just buys David Mitchell all the time, every time, every day. In which case, actually, there's no real relation between it. And so we have to look at the lift because that gives us a real control um, and analysis in terms of the relationship. So Georgie built her box on top of the complicated one in order to try and get association rules which are easy to interpret to explain the recommendations we made. So there was actually quite a lot of success in this. So she found that even when she expanded to very high dimensional spaces, say, for example, even up to 100, she was able to match the accuracy of the recommendation models that she had, simulating it with um, association rules. And she was also able to explain up to about 80% of the decisions that were made by the recommendation models. So this is really useful, apart from the fact that we're basically inventing our own way of evaluating whether something's interpretable. So it still needs to be passed on to the user because really the user is the person who decides, can I understand the decision that's been made or not? So this gives us a nice baseline and a nice way of being able to present it to people, but we still need to go back and evaluate and say, do you believe it to be interpretable? Okay, so now for something completely different uh, with uh, my topic. So I was looking at the idea of emotion in video. So can we predict the emotion of a video and can we localize within the video where the emotion is happening? So this is very similar again into recommendations. Why do we want to do this? Well, actually it can be useful information to have for somebody to find the right video that they want to see. 
So say, for example, you have all these different comedy shows. Uh, you could argue that actually the mood between Green Wing, Peep Show, and uh, Big Bang Theory is all quite different. Peep Show is quite gritty, quite realistic. It's um, quite painful and embarrassing. Big Bang Theory is kind of fr family friendly, fun, bombastic, and Green Wing a bit odd. Um, and so it's useful to, to be able to have this extra information. So what I was doing is using an emotional model that basically maps things into two-dimensional space, and we can, the idea is we can plot any emotion within that space. Uh, then I was using neural nets, and you can adapt neural nets to be able to try and see where they are basically making their decisions. So what parts of the image are leading the neural net to make that decision, to make that emotional prediction. Um, so that's all fine and well. We can localize, we can make these heat maps of the decisions we make. But actually, because emotions aren't objects, it's very hard to evaluate that. Like, how do you, how do you know if you've made a good decision? So what we did is we got humans to annotate images. And so on the left, we have the raw images annotated by humans. And so we got them to say, where do you think the emotion is happening here? Uh, on the far left is the filtered human uh, annotations, because we don't want to just have every annotation somebody drew. We want to have a consensus, basically, of what the humans all agree, or more than half the humans agreed, was an emotional moment. We decided to have a baseline model to compare our model against, because even if we get an evaluation against the humans, it still doesn't really tell us whether that's performing well or not, because this hasn't been done before. So in the middle is face detection, and on the right is the CAM output, so the classification activation mapping. Uh, we see the CAM is mixed at best at predicting the area of emotion, and the results, unfortunately, weren't very encouraging. Um, so we see that often it gets quite confused, and if it doesn't know exactly what to pinpoint, it just predicts the whole image. In which case, if you're trying to map ratios of areas, it just means the evaluation metric comes up completely bottoms out. Uh, but the face detection was surprisingly accurate, so that's another area of research that we could potentially explore later. And last, but certainly not least, is Ruon. So Ruon was looking at um, basically forecasting and forecasting TVR. So in, um, in the TV industry, TVR is really kind of one of our main metrics that we use to trade against. So it's called television viewer rating, and it's really a measure of what percent of the number of people who've watched a certain piece of broadcast. So if I said uh, there was a TVR of 12, of 16 to 24s, if you watched Hollyoaks last night, that means 12% of all 16 to 24s saw that episode of Hollyoaks last night. So this is useful for advertising, because it helps advertisers uh, basically manage their, compla their campaigns, who they target to, um, how, how much money they should invest in the campaigns, how many people they think are going to see the adverts. It's important for us in terms of like, trying to optimize our scheduling, how many, when should we put our TV shows, how to try and get the most number of people across all of our TV shows to watch. Um, and so actually, traditionally, the, the, the methods at the moment are, are, are actually not that bad. So the way they do it is they uh, basically take the TVR from last year and they go, okay, um, let's take the TVR from last year and then just adjust. So you have like a lot of these industry experts who take into account of different things, so say for example the Olympics being on last year, and they, they try to adjust the estimates based on, based on their previous estimates. Um, and this works okay, but there's a lot of information that does affect the number of people uh, who watch the TV program and isn't taken account for. Uh, this costs a lot of money to get wrong. So because we trade um, ad inventory on it, it means that if, we, if fewer people watch, then we owe the, the advertisers money. If more people watch, it means that we haven't monetized money that we could have otherwise made. So it's really important to try and get this right. Uh, at the moment, the estimates have cost about $200 million in American TV industry uh, for incorrect predictions. But it's very hard to estimate. So everyone was kind of looking at different ways of fitting distributions. So sometimes it, a lot of the models kind of take a very global approach of trying to fit all the points at once. But actually what you want to do is you want to fit lots of 
uh, single distributions and then fit those all together. Uh, I didn't explain that very well, sorry. But basically, in the middle one, you're fitting all the points and fitting the mean. In the mixture model, what you're doing is you're fitting the blue, the orange, and the gray separately, and then fitting across those means. And that gives you a, a better prediction. And so the reason this is useful for us is because TV shows aren't shown season one, season two, season three, season four, all in one one big shot. You have season one, and then a break, season two, and a break, season three. And what tends to happen over time is the viewership over seasons, just pretty much every show goes down every season on season. And so it's important not to try and fit everything across from all the seasons previously because you get skewed results. Um, this is important as well in terms of forgetting. So Ruon incorporated, so this is data he had in terms of seasons. So we see that we have season one, season two, season three. And then what happens is the viewership goes down over time. If we take the old models that kind of predict from all the previous information, then what happens is you have two high estimates when you get to the next seasons, because you're still taking kind of all the information from the previous season. If we allow the model to forget information, I know you take the past few days uh, into consideration, or the past few episodes into consideration, then what happens is you kind of see in the second season, it starts off quite high and then it drops. And then, then you get more accurate predictions of TVR. So it's quite encouraging. And he's had really, um, really good results in terms of uh, Channel 4 data uh, beating uh, ad sales uh, predictions in our kind of simulated test set. But we'll see whether it works in real life. Um, so in general, uh, I guess the point I'm trying to make is kind of the importance of sharing data between the two, the two partnerships. So, I mean, obviously for us, um, we have a lot of data that we want to be able to use. And there's lots of simple machine learning methods that we would use, but there's kind of cutting edge research which we're not always going to uh, employ, partly because of time, because of risk. We don't always know if these methods will work. By creating a academic partnership, it allows us and it gives us freedom to explore avenues of interest that we might not otherwise explore. For the academics, they have data that they want to get their hands on. I mean, we have a lot of very good, high quality data, um, and people want to be able to simulate their models on that. So it's really a, a joint partnership in, in making the most of the data that we have. Um, being able to train people on the job through the MRES scheme really means that we expand our recruitment channels. So we're not just going for kind of the very stereotypical computer science person who's come out. We actually get a huge range of uh, expertise, both um, both mathematically, but also people who have kind of other uh, other training in, say, for example, marketing or, say, for example, Georgian economics, getting a real kind of more rounded business model for a data scientist. So um, communication between fields is really important. So. Um, Typically, research and industry, they kind of like live their own separate lives, and occasionally one would speak to the other and things caught up. But by creating these MRES, it really means that actually we're, we're keeping a real touching stone between the two of saying like, okay, well, what, what interesting ideas do you have to offer me, and what do I think is an important idea? So, that, so as the industry, we're really feeding them, telling them what, what is like actually financially important for us, what do you think is viable, what is actually scalable in terms of uh, introducing into industry. And the research people come along and they say, well, you know, we've got this new idea, why don't we try it out? So it's um, being able to have a, a very fast um, uh, communication between the two different industries. And then the coordination. So it was difficult, I think, um, particularly at the start between UCL and Channel 4, trying to coordinate time and interest and really like setting out our goals in terms of what we both want. But we um, really, it's a, it's a very good uh, partnership between both time and kind of confidentiality of data and ideas as well. So hopefully you'll agree, it's been a success. <laughs> uh, I think so. Uh, any questions about the thing? Yes. So, okay, so a TV show that hasn't ever been seen? It's a very good question. <laughs> it's a cold start problem. Um, there's different factors that you have. So, 
Okay, sorry. The question was, uh, for a TV show that's never been seen and never been broadcast, how do we predict the TVR? Um, there's a variety of different ways. I mean, the most traditional is you go, first, where, when is it being shown? So obviously you look at the prime time, when is it being shown in the day? Um, I should preface this with saying I haven't done forecasting, so I'm not the expert on this. Um, but then you'll look at things like genre. You tend to, what we do is we have ad sales who will make predictions about the, the demographic of people who will watch it and something that we kind of feed back into as well as data scientists. We try and predict, um, okay, this show is similar to this show here. We expect them to have the same audience. And so what we'll do is for a show that we do know the, the TVR for, then we can make predictions based on that. And so it's still, you know, there's still an element of finger in the winds, kind of, you, you have a feel for it. I mean, typically it's people with, you know, lots of industry experience who really have a kind of very intuitive understanding of what, what works well when. Um, it's difficult, forecasting is a difficult problem and there's a reason why people have been working on it for <laughs> decades, really. Uh, so it's, it's basically, you take, take the basic program information and try and find another program that's similar. That's the most typical way. Uh, do we also consider what else is going on? Definitely. So, say for example, when I said about the Olympics, I mean, we know, against the BBC, <laughs> we know the BBC is showing the Olympics and we're going to get f lower ratings. Uh, we know in summertime that we're going to get lower ratings because people are outside watching, um, enjoying the sunshine rather than watching TV. We know there's big events, like say for example the Royal Wedding or something, then fewer people are going to watch Channel 4. So you definitely, there's, there's large scale events that you know are happening well in advance that you, you scale your, your TVR uh, predictions for. So, as a, it's a very good question. <laughs> um, uh, so, did everybody hear the question? Um, okay, so as some even pointed out beforehand, we have Alex and Neil, who are kind of like our dream team. Uh, they're our data strategists. So, to be honest, it's a bit of both. Um, so, say for example, when I come back into Channel 4, I'm, as of 10 minutes later, I'm on the holiday, but um, <laughs> I, I'll be working in a different department. So part of the aim of that is for us to send out data scientists and really kind of understand what the other departments are doing. And the idea behind that is for us to be like, hang on, have you been doing that this whole time? We could offer you this product here. But it's really just all about keeping a very open dialogue between all the different departments. So uh, Alex and Neil are important in both bringing ideas to us and saying like, okay, scheduling have said that they actually would really like it if you could do X, Y, and Z. Us being able to feed back to them and actually saying what's uh, realistic, because I think sometimes what happens with data science is you produce a few numbers and a few models and then people think you can work magic and you can just, I don't know, make a million pounds predicting something and actually, so is, that's not always realizable. So it's really important for us to us to manage expectations in terms of what our capabilities are. Um, I think it probably began, as, as Sanjeev said, more of a kind of us being like, oh, we could do this and we can do that and like kind of theorizing about data products. I think once other people in the company start understanding what we do, it's easier to develop things together. But it's really a case of, it, it, it's not one going to the other, it's very much an open dialogue between the two departments trying to really figure out what the problems are and if there's anything we can solve. So. Yes? What, what data, sorry? Uh, 
So we have we do have surveys that we send out to people. Um, so say for example, in the emotion side of it, I actually didn't end up using it because it used a different metric and things. But we we do send out open questionnaires to users. Obviously, there's a limitation in kind of scale. Uh, so I think we're all data hungry, and we would all like as much data as possible and try and. So it's, it's easier and more efficient to gather data through things like all four, where you kind of have passive information that you get, that get through click, click, uh, click streams. But we, we do. We, we, we openly ask people. Um, and so we ask people about their impressions about adverts or their, their mood or what they believe the emotion behind a certain program is. And so some of these are quite big, say several thousand people. It, it depends on the survey and things. It's, it's more just trying to recruit people to do that. And obviously, humans cost a lot of money. And once you have that information, it's actually only really valuable once. You can't, you can't typically when you take um, human annotated data, it's valuable for that time. It's very hard to generalize it across other things you use. And also, humans are really variable. Um, <laughs> they're not always that consistent. So you have to be very careful about the questions you ask um, and the way you ask them. So. Humans are very good because they're really the benchmark that everyone wants to measure against, but they're also difficult. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, now that you have all these insights and all this information, uh, what are the plans to make the game more open? Let's say allowing suppliers and providers to connect to maybe an audience platform. So are you asking about the research projects themselves, or are you asking yeah, about? Now you have access to all these insights, this information about the viewers and preferences and things like that. It might be relevant for, for this particular project or any of the projects that you have within the company. So, I mean, I don't think I'm best placed to answer this. I don't have like a. I'm not too sure exactly about the strategy behind this. Um, Obviously, we have quite a strict data policy um, that some of you might have seen our video that came out of Alan Carr and things. And so, um, and you know, realistically, that's probably going to have to be revised soon because of the way the team works and because the whole data data landscape has changed. But actually, we have a we have a responsibility to our viewers to honor that agreement that we've said and we said we're only using our data for certain things and so in terms of monetizing our data that's really a question that i can't answer i think most of our data is really driven behind channel four so are we monetizing it yes because we're trying to create uh get more people to watch more shows we're trying to create better shows we're trying to make more money from the shows we create but in terms of like selling out as individual data products i think that's something that would be happening if not now like a few years down the line to be honest um i think that's better asked answered by sanjeev um, yeah uh sorry man at the back and then I'll Um, so actually, there's already data sets that exist for that information. Um, my data set that I used for my for my emotion wasn't actually Channel 4 data because I needed ground truth labels for me to be able to decide whether my algorithm was performing well. Uh, the data set I used was called Lyris Seed, and they have a certain number of um, physiological signals. There's other ones called the Humane Database that also has a large number of um, physiological signals. It really depends exactly on what you're wanting to measure in things. Again, it's expensive and it takes a lot of time to do stuff like that. So 
why not use the data set that somebody's already created for you and has been validated? Um, but they are available, so if you, if you, I can try and give you some names afterwards if you'd like, and of like places you can find the data sets. Um, yeah, it's actually it's really important, and they have like lots of very interesting um, contrasts between what humans report the emotion they say and the the human that uh, the emotion that's reported physiologically. Um, also, particularly with the um, annotations that I had, uh, there's there's also a discussion about whether or not you can focus interest based on eye gaze and things like that. But we didn't have time, unfortunately. And I have one time. Okay, one more. <laughs> uh, Sorry. Okay, so that's that's an easier question to answer. <laughs> I uh, so I was using Python. Um, so it depended exactly on what people were, were applying. So I was doing neural nets. So I was using Keanu and Kira's. Um, ben was using TensorFlow, uh, but in, the, in terms of implementation, we also within Channel Four we we're using a lot of Amazon Web Services and S3. So, say for example, the face recognition I ran through um, Amazon recognition um, in order to get the face banding boxes. Uh, so we have uh, we're using EC2 instances and things like that in terms of like, processing power. Okay, I think we have to let the other people in. It's working well. <laughs> Hello, welcome back. Um, we're just going to make a start now on the afternoon sessions. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed lunch. Uh, and this session is uh, an award giving, which makes it nice and fun and some interesting, uh, interesting examples. So uh, the second part of this is we're going to be giving out the award for the best industrial placement for this year. Uh, but the first part is actually something we did earlier on in the year called the Data Lab Challenge Competition. So I'm just going to explain a little bit about what we did and then uh, ask the winning team to come up and they can, they can tell you what they did. So um, the Data Lab uh, funds, with the funding from Scottish Funding Council and the European Social Fund, uh, 90 uh, data science master's students last year. And uh, they, they study across seven different universities. And then what the Data Lab does, we bring everyone together uh, for a series of events to try and help build a network, but also to try and uh, develop a different range of skills, skills that uh, we'll hear a little bit more about later, but are absolutely essential for data scientists. And here, here are some of them that we think uh, are particularly crucial to being a, a high-quality data scientist, so working in a team, storytelling, um, framing the right question, um, understanding data ethics, these sort of things. So we were, we were thinking about how we could help this community of Scottish data science students really develop to grow some of these skills as well as the outstanding technical skills that the universities are, are providing. So what we did is we had uh, free weekend hackathons, quite a big ask of all the students. So thank you very much for all the students here who came to these free weekend events. And the idea was that they would use Scottish data sets to conceive of and develop an idea that is going to drive some impact for Scotland using data. So uh, it was a, a really exciting few weekends. And what we had to then um, meet in terms of a criteria was we had to do some high quality data analysis. We had to drive some impact for Scotland. Uh, it had to be an innovative idea. Uh, we had to demonstrate really high quality teamwork. They communicated well and they learned a lot. So we're not asking for a great deal, really. You know, it's just. Uh, um, so it went really, really well, and we had some really exciting teams develop some really good ideas. So I just want to quickly talk through the third place team, the second place team, and then invite up the first place. So the third place team um, included Lauren Fairley, uh, Fiona Leach, Philip Butlin from University of Stirling, Johannes Posma uh, from University of Dundee, and David Treadgold from University of Strathclyde. And they used census data based on air pollution in Glasgow to um, produce a bit of business analysis that would help local transport providers uh, best allocate bus routes for green technology. So understand those polluted parts of Glasgow were, and then using their analysis to actually say, this is, where, this is the best place a green bus route should go. So that was a tremendous idea. And uh, if you do see any of the, that team in, uh, in the break, do say congratulations. The second team 
uh, was with Richard Main, Matej Polichek, and Ewan Walls uh, from University of Glasgow and University of West of Scotland. Uh, and they used the same air pollution data to actually come up with an app to show you how much of that pollution you'd been exposed to as you walked around Glasgow. A terrifying but very useful, very useful tool. Uh, and I'm delighted to say that the winning team and the, uh, who will be awarded this fantastic and very heavy trophy uh, will be, went to Robert Hamlet, Cynthia Morell, and Peter Henriksen, who I'm going to invite up to the stage and ask a couple of questions about. So thank you very much. Um, so, Robert, in, are you able to just give us a quick uh, overview about what you did and what, what, you, uh, what made it a winning, a winning entry? Yeah, I, I can try. Um, so we, we focused on the task of, of fly tipping within Scotland. And we reasoned that this was, a, this was a, um, a, a crime that could be broken down into a series of uh, you know, predictions that you could make based on some factors, you know, trying to predict where and when it might occur. Um, based on proximity to, say, a police station, or the time since the last flight tipping event. Um, so throughout the year, we, we worked on, on how we could assemble a, a way of predicting that. Um, and along the way, there were some challenges. Uh, the, the first and greatest was a lack of availability of data. Um, now, this data, a bit of context, is held by local authorities. And in the first half of the year, it was hard to get a hold of it. Uh, culminating in, in the second event throughout the year, in February, where you know, it, it looks unlikely. So following that, we took it up upon ourselves to try and get it ourselves. Um, and I think the, the key to achieving that is to know what you're trying to achieve, who to approach for it, and why they should help you. you know, what's the value of your work to them? And I, I think we put together a pretty, pretty reasonable value proposition for them, working with stakeholders from um, uh, Zero Waste Scotland, uh, to, to obtain the data from, from three, three local authorities from which we were able to build successfully a, a platform on which uh, visualizations and anal anal analysis can be performed. Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, the judges agreed it was a really exciting prospect, but I think the thing which really stood out was the fact that you'd, uh, you'd taken steps to find the data yourself uh, and reached out to partnership uh, to show that actually you were capable of driving something that could be useful for Scotland. So, um, Peter, I was just going to ask you now, because I know you've done an industrial placement here uh, um, in Edinburgh with SNAP40. Can you just tell me a little bit about what you've been doing there? Right. Well, I work for SNAP40, uh, which is a company, a startup company here in Edinburgh, developing a wearable device to uh, predict uh, patient health deterioration. And so it does that through a device that sits on the arm and, and measures a lot of things on the patient. And I was working specifically on uh, generating a, a novel algorithm to uh, make predictions on the temperature of the patient. <coughs> and uh, it was a very great experience, I think, <laughs> um, which allowed me to get a real insight of uh, what it is to work in a startup tech company. Yeah, great, thank you very much. So I just, uh, I just wanted to um, offer them this uh, fantastic award. You'll have to share it in some way. Um, so can I just ask for one more round of applause for Robert and um, Peter. Great, thank you very much. I know you can take it away. Yeah, thank yeah. you very much. Okay, so now we have the uh, Industrial Placement Award. Uh, so I'm delighted to say we have uh, three students who are going to come up on stage and talk a little bit about their industrial placement. Uh, but first of all, I just want to explain what this process was. So we asked for the students who undertook an industrial placement this year to submit a video to us about their experiences, what they've learnt, and how they uh, led some impact within the organisation they were based. And what we have on offer uh, today, apart from this great trophy, is um, there will be a free ticket to, to DataFest next year, uh, a free ticket to another data science conference of your choice, and also some training um, with Ian, who provided some great personal branding workshop earlier on. So we're now just going to go through individual presentations. And first off, I'm going to invite uh, Spiros Maratis from University of Glasgow, who's done a project with Nalytics based in Glasgow as well. So give a round of applause for Spiros.
So Spiros is going to do a little demonstration here, so we're just going to get that set up. Hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Data Lab and MBN that, uh, for this exciting year. Uh, through uh, the whole three data hackathon events, they gave me the opportunity to interact with uh, different uh, people from different backgrounds, uh, being able to use my skills, share my skills, and also see how people use their skills in, uh, in, this, date, in this type of event. I uh, also had uh, the chance to, to fetch and um, analyze a uh, corporate data set, uh, corporate level data set, which was very interesting. And uh, the best part was to see how many different solutions and how many different questions can be created from uh, different people for the same kind of data. Uh, the next awesome part of my year was the placement, the three, uh, the three month placement through the summer, um, <clears throat> where Analytics gave me the use case of um <clears throat> building a text classifier. So let me log in. It's a live, uh, it's a live demo. Sorry, sorry, sorry for any. So th through these three months, uh, I came down. I believe I came down to a simple, some simple steps that data scientists can use uh, in order to tackle any any single uh, data science problem. So the first, the first thing someone needs to know is to know first of all the client uh, needs to know what the client asks from his own data and what is asked from uh, from you to to do. Uh, in my case, I did uh, a mistake, and for the first few for the first two weeks, I was uh, uh, start implementing something completely different from what I've been asked for, and uh, then I had to to cut up with uh, with my work my work in order to <coughs> to correct that. Um, the second most uh, Sorry for that. The second most important part is to be able to find find the data you want in order to, to solve your, your, your problem. Uh, those data are not always going to be free and uh, are not always going to uh, to be given for you for uh, for free. So I had to ask from different organizations to give me the data I wanted, which, which was contract, uh, contract data. And it's difficult to, uh, to, to, to take those data because they contain um, confidentiality clauses, uh, clauses inside. So in order to proceed and build, build my model, I had to find similar kind of contracts and then build the model that later can be tuned in order to, um, in order to process UK contract documents. Uh, the next step is to process and explore your data. You need to clean the data. You need to be able to bring the data in a format that uh, you can understand what the, the information they, they, they have inside in a more uh, abstract uh, way. So you can formulate better your, your questions towards this kind of data. Uh, <clears throat> The next part is the analysis part. This is the, the core of the project. This is what is hidden behind that classify button. Uh, it's the machine learning model. It's the artificial intelligence agent. It's the predictive or statistical uh, regression model you're going to build in order to, <clears throat> to, solve and to solve your problem and answer the questions you have set in the first place. Uh, after the, the, analytics, the analysis part, the last and the most important part for me is uh, to be able to present and communicate your results with your, with your client. Uh, even if you're the best uh, statistician, if you're the best programmer in the world, nothing matters if you cannot communicate your results, if you're not a good storyteller, if you cannot communicate what you, what you have done with your, your client, so present your results. Uh, I'm waiting for, for the process to finish so I can give you some visualizations. Um, <clears throat> So through, through these three months in, uh, in my placement, I learned how to, to work in an industrial environment. I learned how to work uh, inside the team and uh, communicate and interact with uh, uh, another, other data scientists, which uh, was, uh, very, it was very good for me to, I, I managed to learn from them and I managed to, uh, to see how the data, how big, big data environments works uh, in reality because uh, all the theoretical knowledge I, I, I had from the university uh, it mattered only if I'm able to apply it. To apply it. <clears throat> yeah. 
control this technical problem. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. Probably I won't be able to show you the the results. So the communication part was just destroyed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that that was everything from me. Uh, I want to thank you very much, and uh, also thanks uh, very much, Detalab and MBN again for for this exciting year. No, thanks. No, thanks very much, Spiros. I know that uh, this always happens, right? So it's, uh, yeah. it's a good gamble, but it's fine. Um, so I just wanted to ask you, um, what was the biggest difference from going from uh, the university setting uh, than when you started working within industry? What was the sort of biggest lesson you learned? Uh, so I, I learned how to, to work in an actual team in the university. You have all your assignments to do, to do them alone. Uh, you have all your projects alone. But if you're in... Um, in a company, you need to, to know how to communicate with other people, you need to know how to listen to what people have to say and not listen, you know, while you listen, think your own thing, you have to actually listen to them, mm. process what they say and then uh, act accordingly to, to that. that. That was the biggest difference for me from going from university where you act alone to uh, an industry environment. Great, well, uh, can I have one more round of applause for Spiros? Mm. <laughs> So um, next up, we have Lauren Fairley from uh, the University of Stirling, who did the MSc Data Science for Business. Um, and she was working at the company Free. So uh, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Josh has told you, my name is Lauren Fairley. I went to the University of Stirling. And I did a course in data science for business. Now, I'd like to take you through three main um, questions, if you will, today. And I'd like to start with why I chose to get um, involved with the Data Lab MSc and what really drew me um, to this route that I've taken over the last year. Now, to do this, we have to go back a year. It seems like a long time now. Um, but I was a recent economics graduate. I had crashed econometrics in my last year, and I, I loved it. Um, but I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, you know. I liked maths, I liked problem solving. Really, I wanted to be Sherlock Holmes, but didn't have the constitution. Um, so I really wanted to go into something that, that let me work out the, work out the solution to problems. Um, then I found out about the Data Lab MSc, um, which supported me into a career in data science in Scotland, which is fantastic because it was something that once I got reading about it more, I got more and more interested in and more invested in. Because you can apply data science to almost every industry, this is really something that I could tailor to, to my needs and my wants and my skills, um, which was a big draw to me. Um, but it also let me draw on the skills that I gained in my undergraduate degree, specializing in economics. Um, I'd done a little bit of analysis, applied that, really liked it. So where else can I apply this? What, el uh, what other value can I add in other places? Um, so I went to the University of Stirling. Uh, the course there was the best option for me. It was a combination of business acumen and technical skills that, that really attempted to, to get a very well-rounded um, data analyst out at the end. Um, and I think really we were meant to be the translators for the business world from all you, you tech quizzes. So uh, that was a really interesting time and I really learned a lot and met many wonderful people. So that was a really growing experience for me. Um, then I think the next question that we have to look at is what did I actually gain? What benefits did I derive from my year with the Data Lab? And there was lots. Um, so I, I think the first one that I had to look at that I really enjoyed was the competitions, the hackathons. Um, that was a great opportunity to actually get my hands on data that I could do data analysis on for the first time. Um, and it offered a really good opportunity to, to learn to work properly in a team of data analysts. There was lots of opportunities for knowledge sharing, uh, and I came out knowing a lot more about data science than I'd gone in with. Um, so that was a really exciting time for me. Um, and then I'd like to go to the networking events, which has also been great, because I don't know if you'd be able to tell, but I, I was a bit nervous um, approaching professionals, um, because as a student, I just didn't feel I was there yet. 
Um, but it's, it's really given me the confidence to know that you know, you're just people too, so <laughs> we, can, we can come have a chat. Um, and I think that was really important because having these nerves going into a career in the first place um, could absolutely be detrimental to my success. So getting that out of the way before I'm in the workplace is fantastic. Um, and I think the, one of the last ones I have to look at is the interview experience and work experience. Um, firstly, I've never had a proper job interview, if you can believe it. Um, so the, all the work that MBN did with us, getting pr us prepared, um, getting us ready for that, offering us great opportunities uh, with many great companies, that really gave me the confidence to say, hey, I can do an interview, this isn't too bad. <laughs> um, so I think that was hugely beneficial going forward in a career because you're always going to have to be interviewed. It's skills that you need now. So that was fantastic. But out of it, I got the best thing of all. <laughs> um, I got a place, work placement with 3UK, the, the telecoms provider. Um, and it was my first choice, by the way. Um, and what I did, well, let's start off with who 3 are. 3 are a challenger brand in the UK telecoms market. Um, they push the rest of the market to improve themselves by being customer-centered, data-rich, um, and pretty cool. I like them. <laughs> um, but what I, what I got, the benefit that I got from Three was first of all going in, their support was fantastic. My uh, industry advisor, Don, was just an outstanding help. He has supported me through you know, all the challenges that I faced with my, my project, but also he came up with a really good project for me to do. So um, my project was actually identifying and modeling price-led churn, um, which is, is quite a big topic because it can be applied to, to lots of subscription-based businesses. Um, and it was really good for, for what my skill set was. So thinking back to my graduate degree in economics, I had a background in behavioral economics, and that was really helping looking at those motivations as to why people um, were churning out. And also, it really, it was business-centered. Um, you had to look very much at the uh, impact to other areas of the business and where it could be improved. And that was uh, really challenging but interesting because it let me use a lot of the data science skills that I learned in my, my master's degree and a lot of the business stuff. So um, it, it really was well-rounded for my skills. Um, so... I think I would like to talk about maybe just the challenges and successes from that. Um, the biggest challenges now, it was a challenge in itself because the topic I was covering was quite difficult. Um, but I think the benefit to this was that I was supported there by my industry supervisor. My academic supervisor gave me a lot of help. Um, and that really made it far less of a daunting challenge going in. Uh, but when you get there, you've got all the usuals. So you've got some data quality issues. Um, you've got definitions, um, which was something that I hadn't even anticipated going in. Do, do they define all their data the same way? No. Um, <laughs> which, which was bizarre to me, but it's fantastic because I'm getting to face these real-world problems before I'm in the real world. So um, I think that was, that was huge in knowing what I should expect going forward. Um, my successes, I think I, I have to very much attribute to that, to the help that I've had. Um, at the end, I did get knee deep in data and I did come out with some, some interesting insights um, and some recommendations that they could do to improve their data going forward. Um, so I think from my perspective, I delivered something to them. And in speaking with um, my academic and industry advisors, I think they believe that with a fresh pair of eyes on, on their business problems that, you know, I've contributed to them as well. Um, so I'd just like to finish up actually by thanking Three um, and Don for all the work they've done with me and, you know, really getting me to this point, giving me confidence now to pursue um, a career in, in data science. Um, I really can't thank you enough because this is the beginning of my career, which is very exciting for me. Um, I also have to thank my... Uh, industry advisor and course director, uh, John Bowers and, and Kepa. They've been fantastic, um, keeping me on the right track and making sure I could actually do it data science by the time I got into my placement. Um, I'd also like to thank MBN. Uh, I, it was fantastic. It was the best placement I could have asked for. Um, and I, wow, well done. <laughs> and 
finally to, to the data lab. I mean, you're supporting the career that I want in my future in Scotland and the place that I want to be. And I can't thank you enough because you're really setting, setting me up for a great life. So thank you very much. So yeah, thank you very much. That was a brilliant talk. Um, I guess the, the question, the obvious question is, so what's next for you? I mean, what, where do you want to go your career? And also, what are the next sort of steps for your learning? I think as far as learning, um, what I'd really like to do is get stuck into the technical stuff now. So I've had a look um, at Python and, and SQL, and I'm getting familiar with them, but I really want to be really techie like you guys. <laughs> so um, I think that's the next step for me um, as far as continuing my learning. What I'd like to do beyond here is really get into a, a, an insight role, uh, mm. look at that data and, and work out what's going on. I think that would be um, a really fun job and, and fulfill my dream of being Sherlock Holmes. So, <laughs> Well, I'm very confident that's going to work out. Thank so, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> so now, excuse me a second. I'm just going to flip through some slides. Uh, you, I'm afraid you didn't get your name on the back for very long, so we'll have to enjoy it for a couple of seconds. Um, and, uh, and then I'm going to introduce the, um, the... OK, I have to... Uh, yeah. This is learning on the fly. Um, So, the final uh, candidate to come up is Anita George, who is also from the University of Stirling uh, and has worked with the NHS NSS for her placement. So, uh, I'd just like to round of applause as she comes up on stage. Thank you, Josh. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Anita. I'm currently a student in, doing MSc Data Science for Business at the University of Stirling. Data science is all about telling stories with data. Today, I would like to tell a story too. A story of a woman and her graph through the professional and her emotional self. She's an architect, not a software architect. She's an architect who designs buildings and lives in the world of creativity, color, and design. She's a mother. She juggles school life with her own life. She's a wife. She's a daughter. She's a sister. She's a cousin. She's a bestie. She's a friend. She's an acquaintance. The list just goes on. She falls into almost all of the subsets of the whole set of being a woman. She struggled to get back into a career after a gap, but her fury self didn't give up. She saw the opportunities within data science and she saw the program at the University of Stirling. Here, her story begins. With a scholarship from Data Lab, she began the course. Colors, imagination, and creativity, replaced by spreadsheets, business terminologies, and reports. That's where she is now. She was surrounded by students from different nationalities and cultures. She enjoyed the unity within the diversity in the course. The professors had different ways of teaching and they were all very engaging. But soon she started to feel overwhelmed. She found it difficult to catch up with a big career change. Some days she just wanted to quit. While in other days, she found herself glued on one data set or the other. Reports after reports found her way in. She felt intrigued by the amount of information data can reveal. Can the company produce more? Can the company go into profitability? Can this machine map be more faulty? The list just goes on. Group works and self works became exhausting. It required so much of energy and so much of time. But after each module, she realized that she learned so much from her friends and from her colleagues. She either found friends with whom she can share a laugh with, 
or she had found professionals that she would love to work with in the future. She found it extremely difficult to approach lecturers and, and even to tell them that she struggled with something. But she always found help is never far away. She just had to ask and the lecturers were always willing to help. She saw the events of Data Lab announced and she felt that she was not very much at ease networking or being part of workshops. Then came Data Lab. The events, the networking, the challenges. She saw a lot of professionals, students, and attended workshops and listened to the talks. She felt the opportunities within data science is innumerable. But networking doesn't always lead to jobs. But after every handshake and a brief conversation, she began to see the world of opportunities. Behind those professionals with wrinkles, gray hair, bright smiles, enthusiastic talks, and passionate presentations, she saw success. Success in many forms and shapes. Success of juggling family with work life. Success of working through the nights on projects. Success of being passionate about their organization. Success of working with data. Behind those glossy shoes and those clean suits, are days of thoughts, energy, and passion towards your career and towards data. She was just being inspired through all this. However, she couldn't attend all those challenge days. But the days that she could make it, she met many students from different universities around Scotland working on different data and with data sets and with plenty of ideas. As placements started rolling in, she began to feel unsettled again. Then came MBN with the employability workshops and CV guidance. She was quite apprehensive of starting a LinkedIn account. She started her first LinkedIn account and finally through MBN and data science, sorry, sorry, data lab, she found a place at National Health Service, her first choice to work in public health. She was pleased, she was excited, an opportunity to work in the public health was just, was just quite rewarding. But again, she started to question herself again. Can she take on this enormous task? Her project was on patient pathways and costs for patients diagnosed with cataracts. The project could help decisions on optimized pathways for patients in Scotland. Cataracts is one of the major reasons of blindness among the elderly, and it could affect the living conditions of the elderly and make them more vulnerable. It was quite a rewarding project to make a change to me some to be a part of something that you could make a change a life uh, make a change in the life of a person but again the confidentiality the massiveness of the project they were all beginning to make her more tense what she did was that she li lays with the anal analysts from the IST department from the various health boards she could see their perspective she she discussed work streams with the staff from the Scottish government she traveled all the way to Golden Jubilee Hospital to meet a doctor, so see the clinician's perspective. She was mentored by one of the medical directors of the NHS. There was a program coordinator whom you're very familiar with, Jonathan Cameron, and there was a, a project manager. She was well looked after, and she was so excited. Somewhere along the line, she applied for a vacancy and got offered a position as an information analyst in the Health and Social Care Department of Public Health within the NHS. Her professional life was being built up too. Teamwork, presentation, presentation skills, motivation, initiative, proactiveness, communication skills, prioritizing tasks, and data analysis skills were just some of the many skills that she gained. I'm quite sure by the end of this that you're, it's quite obvious that this story is mine. I am her, I'm that she. This is my story but I don't know which stage of this data science journey you are in. But if you are thinking about starting this journey, maybe tomorrow it will be your story here, maybe better than mine. My native language is Malayalam. I come from a country called India, from a small state called Kerala. When words are not enough to express your feelings very well, we say the word which in Malayalam means a language spoken from heart. So today, as I stand overwhelmed with this great opportunity that I've got and the wonderful journey over this past year, all I can say is, Data Lab, 
the University of Stirling, MBN, my family, my friends, and above all, my God. Hridayat and Abhashil, the language spoken from my heart. Thank you. It was a wonderful experience, and I look forward for more. Right, so that was uh, a really, really inspiring talk. I thought it was excellent. Uh, and congratulations, of course, on your job with the NHS. Do you know what you're going to be working on? Sorry, I'll give you a pass. Uh, right now, we haven't started. We're starting on the 25th of September, so the, my, my title is Information Analyst. So it mostly will be on health and social care department. So again, I have been, haven't been able to have told what the data sets and all will be, but I'm looking forward to what is it. Thank you very much. And I think, uh, I think one thing I would say is that, of course, uh, an essential element of being a data scientist is communication. And uh, it, takes a lot of, it takes a lot to sort of come up on stage and talk about your journey. So all three of you have done a fantastic job. Uh, and I also want to say thank you to all of the students who are part of the Data Lab MSc, those who have undertaken placements, uh, who have all done some really good work within Scottish industry. So, um, so thank you all. Um, of course, uh, we give one winner here, and although you're all deserving, we are going to select one. And I just wanted to invite up on stage uh, Paul Forrest, the Executive um, Chairman, uh, Director of uh, MBN Solutions, uh, who has uh, a very wide portfolio of work, including a producer of independent films, uh, a, 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 I can never pronounce it, I'm afraid, SFAO uh, um, Capital Partners, uh, and a photographer at National Geographic as well. So Paul is going to come up and present the award um, to the winner. So uh, let me just hand you this. Thank you. Slightly worried about picking this up. You did promise me it was quite heavy. Yeah, it's heavy enough. <laughs> well, thank you all, uh, all three of you, for some very good and uh, insightful comments and observations about the process of getting into the placement and, and how you were helped by the Data Lab, which is clearly what the program was about, and how MBN helps you with employability skills and the like. Um, it is very difficult in circumstances where we're trying to judge and come up with one person who gets to carry off this. It is actually quite heavy. I'm going to put it down. Um, award at a tiring weekend. Um, but we've got to pick one winner. And, and for us at MBN, the thing that we thought was um, uh, perhaps the project or the placement that had most social impact or the likelihood of the most social impact was, uh, was the one that we wanted to, to make the award to. So without further ado, if I can uh, ask Anita to accept the award, please. We also have some gifts for the second and third place as well. Um, both runners up. <laughs> Which I have to say, I think you'll enjoy this. Um, the tagline is actually particularly interesting. The art of science and prediction. The Nate Silver book, Signal and the Noise. So we have one here. And uh, clearly it's going to be very difficult next year because uh, the programme next year has uh, a larger number, a much larger number of um, uh, placement students and it will make our job all the more difficult. But if they're half as good as you three, then I think we'll enjoy the process. So thank you very much. So yeah, now we're going to go into a panel discussion. Uh, so we'd like to invite all the panel members up onto stage. And it's going to be talking about the opportunities with data within Scottish industry. And that's going to be chaired again by Paul. Hi, everybody. Thank you ever so much for coming back for the final session. Uh, and now we've got, some, we've got two really great talks. So the first is going to, I'm going to welcome Mark Hunter, the Chief Data Officer at Sainsbury's Bank, and Sandy Scott, the Head of Data Science and Analytics, to talk about the Analytics Dream Team three questions that you should ask. Now, just a quick introduction. Sandy joined Sainsbury's Bank in November last year as the head of data science and analytics, as I've described. Uh, he spent six years living in California working uh, eBay and Google, so great track record, and we're 
Delighted he's back in Scotland uh, and he's working in various different roles. Um, Mark joined in April last year uh, as, again, the Chief Data Officer. Uh, before Sainsbury's Bank, he worked 10 years in various organisations across the world, so places like Beijing, Hong Kong and Melbourne. And his last post before coming here was the Head of Analytics and Digital Products at, um, at Coles Financial Services in Australia. Uh, and we're delighted also to say that Mark is now on the Data Lab board, so I'm saying that's a real coup for us. Um, so I'm really delighted to uh, invite you both on stage uh, for their talk. So have a round of applause, please. Thanks, Josh. Afternoon, everyone. All right. So we've heard a lot about this today, about data science and creating your dream team um, and what we're looking for in industry. So we thought we'd put a little talk together that says, kind of, what are the three questions that we would ask ourselves and three questions that we often get asked um, at events like this about you know, what are the bank up to and what's the bank thinking about in terms of its data science efforts. So just a little quick intro. So this is me. Um, I started in the UK uh, actually at Barclays Bank building credit scorecards a um, long time ago. Um, and then done a bunch of roles for RBS over 10 years. Um, worked in a couple of the JVs that RBS did, one with RBS Advanta, where um, I worked for a really cool um, analytics exec that came over from the US. So we learned a lot of the kind of US experience. Um, went on to work in Tesco Bank before it was a bank, so Tesco Personal Finance. Um, and then got the opportunity to go to Beijing, which was sold as a six-month contract. Didn't happen, so I was there for nearly three years. Um, my oldest daughter was born there, um, and then we moved down to Hong Kong for a year and a half um, before moving down to Melbourne. So you can see I was kind of getting further and further away from, from home. Um, my youngest daughter was born there, and then we kind of boomeranged back, so, so that's me. Oh, Sandy? Yeah, so this is a little bit about, about me. So I. Uh, I haven't had quite so many countries on my, uh, on my CV as, uh, as Mark, but I, I started off in the UK actually down in London after I, after I finished a, a, a PhD at Glasgow University, moved down to London, spent a few years down there in uh, consulting, uh, realised realized quite quickly it wasn't really for me, but it's, it takes a while to extract yourself from, from those kind of places, um, but I finally did, and when I did so I moved across to, to California, as, uh, as Josh mentioned. Um, Spent uh, about six years out there uh, with eBay and with Google, uh, and it's interesting. That was actually wasn't just the first place where I heard the term data science. It was actually even the first place where I heard the term analytics. So I'd, I'd been quite a bit into my career before I really even discovered that the fields that were a good fit for me actually even existed. Um, and then you know, I think at that time when I first heard those terms, it probably was quite niche um, in. In, in the part of the world I was in at that time, but obviously now it's, it's spread out much more globally. So I, I took the opportunity recently to, to come back and uh, apply that, that skill set here in Scotland, uh, knowing that there's, there's you know, some, some you know, really interesting work been going on in that space around here. So, so uh, that, I guess that brings, brings me nicely to, to, to the Sainsbury's Bank. And I think given the title of the talk, it's, it's worth just a little bit of context about the bank and where it is in its journey, because I think uh, what we're going to talk about is actually very relevant to what we're doing right at the moment. Um, so, so Sainsbury's Bank, um, it, it, it started off as a, as a JV, as some of you may know, between, um, between Sainsbury's and what, is, what ultimately became part of Lloyd's. Um, we're, we're, we have a very large transformational project going on that's, we're, we're, we're well through, but not by any means finished yet, which is to effectively stand up uh, Sainsbury's Bank as a standalone bank. And the reason, the reason that's relevant is that, uh, you know, you can imagine that takes a lot of bandwidth from an organization, but that hasn't stopped the bank looking to the future and working out what are the, the, the key things it needs to be addressing in the future. And data and analytics and data science is very much core to that. So, you know, Mark and I are quite fortunate, I think, to have come into an organization that has a very, uh, uh, very strong buy-in at a senior level that data and data science is something that's really important, uh, but that pr I think prior to us coming didn't really have much sense beyond, I think what a few people have mentioned, you know, that within financial services you have already the kind of credit risk modeling side of things, et cetera, but you don't really have the, 
the big data to go, go into buzzwords and the data science side of things. So they know, they, they know that that is important to them. They know that given where the, the bank sits as part of a supermarket group with access to some really interesting data that nobody else or almost nobody else in our space has access to. Um, we've got some really interesting opportunities there, and, but it's not clear to them exactly what, what that looks like. And we've got that opportunity to, to shape that and relevant to the, the, what we're talking about now, build the team that's actually going to, to help realize that advantage. Cool. So uh, in terms of the, the three questions, this is the first one that we'll talk about. So the first one is, what skills do you need to make up that analytics dream team? So the, the, the first thing I would say here, before we show what those skills are, it's quite a long list. Um, it would be, you know, I'd, I'd actually be quite scared to meet the person, the individual who has all of that. Uh, and if you guys ever meet him, do not send his CV to my boss, because then I'm out of a job. <laughs> um, but being serious about it, you know, it's, it's a team. You're building a team. You need, there's a broad set of skills you need, and, but you need, you need that across the team. You do not need that in any one individual. So just keep that in mind as we, as we talk, through, talk through this rather long list of what are, what are the skills that you need in your analytics dream team. So um, what I'll do, I'll, I'll focus a little more on the stuff near the top because this is, um, despite what I said a minute ago, this to some extent, if I'm thinking about an individual data scientist, um, this is kind of roughly the order of priority that I'm going to look in for that one individual, knowing though that I'm not going to get all of those things for that, for that single individual. Um, but obviously, just kind of top of the list is the, the raw analytical horsepower, if you like. And for me, that's such a core part that when I'm, when I'm actually out in the market recruiting for a data scientist, on top of just the, the standard interviews, talking through with people, understanding what they've done, understanding what skills they've got, we'll also always do an, an exercise where we actually test that directly so that we can see, see that, that somebody has actually got that, that, that kind of horsepower. And I think that was particularly important a few years ago when there wasn't the programs that you're starting to see now in, in data science, um, which can be a really good marker now that somebody has got that. You know, a few years ago that didn't exist. The only way to know if somebody actually had that skill set was to test it very, very directly yourself. So hopefully something that's become slightly less important over time, but still something that's always been in my uh, kind of drawer when I'm thinking about recruiting for a data scientist. And then, so what I mean when I talk about that analytical horsepower. So First one, um, it's up there as kind of maths and, and, and stats and experimental design. I more broadly think of that as, as the quantitative skills. Um, and I do very much like to have uh, a range of different kind of backgrounds that drive up to that quantitative skill in the team if possible. So to give a, a, a specific example of that, I, uh, I, I recently brought into my team somebody who was very much a statistician and a statistician in, 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 a, in a very specific niche, which was a survey analyzing surveys that people have, have responded to. So not on the scale that you would think of when you think of data science, and as I say, very focused on statistics. Uh, but I, I walked into a very interesting conversation between him and a couple of my data scientists the other week. And without going into, into too much technical detail, they were talking about the fact that the term non-parametric means different things to a data scientist or a statistician. To a data scientist, it means you've built a model that doesn't rely on, in, on kind of any underlying structure. Uh, in the model itself. For the statistic, statistician, it's more you're, you're looking at data that doesn't fit a particular distribution. So different, different meanings, but it actually, it, it sparked a really interesting conversation. You could see that the kind of knowledge getting shared across the team, and uh, I, I saw in the approach that the data scientists were taking some of the problems they were addressing just a week or two later, a, a different, some different, <laughs> excuse me, some different thinking that came off the back of that conversation. So really getting that kind of broad range of quantitative skills is very important. Um, scientific rigor, that's, I think somebody mentioned the scientific method earlier on actually as well. That's, that's also something that's very important to me. Uh, and it's mainly because I actually came a little bit of a cropper on this myself very early on in my career. Um, so one of, the, one, of the, one of the things I've got a bit of a bee in my, a bonnet, a bee in my bonnet about now is, is pea hunting. So those of you who, are, who know the, the problem that, that's kind of surfacing quite a bit in social sciences today where um, you know, people really need to have positive results to be able to publish. So we'll do a test on a big set of people. The hypothesis won't pan out there. So then they'll just look at smaller and smaller slices until they find a positive result. 
if you do that in enough cases, just by pure chance, you're going to get something positive. Uh, and early on in my career, I was, we were uh, helping uh, within a small part of eBay move from a search engine to another search engine. And uh, what we had to do there, and from a business perspective, this all makes sense. We had a bunch of partners that were being served by the old search engine. We had to make sure that they, there was no detriment to their performance when we went to the new search engine. Um, and then we had a bunch of parameters on the search engine that we could parameterize per partner. So of course, we went to try and optimize the, the performance for that search engine for each of those partners. Ended up with some fantastic results, but what had we done? We had just taken a big set, put it into much smaller sets, optimized each one individually, and gone p-hunting, and ended up with some very, very high numbers we were saying that was gonna, you're gonna see for an increase in performance. We did see an increase in performance, but was it up here? No, it was down here somewhere. So, so that scientific rigor, the understanding of the scientific method, that, that kind of background is obviously very important in what, we're, what, we, what you want in your team as well. Um, technology and data, again, obviously uh, quite, quite critical. From a bank-specific point of view, that's very critical to us because there's a whole bunch of, they're not really new anymore, but new open source tools out there that haven't really percolated into the bank yet, and we need to make sure we bring in the skills with those to, to be able to use the new, the new skill sets that, or the new tools that, that Mark and his team are building and to ensure that we can get the, the people in the bank who, who love doing the analysis but have been using the same tools for a long time upskilled on those as well. Um, and then the one that's at the bottom of this list, um, and it's, very, it's there very deliberately, and again, I think this refers back to what you heard from some people earlier on. Domain-specific knowledge is obviously very useful, but the risk you run if everybody, you know, particularly in, with what we're trying to do in financial services where we're introducing a a new approach, a new skill set. If you bring in a lot of people who already have financial services background, you're going to have a limited set of ways of thinking of any problem in your, in your organization. And you really want breadth in that. So you've got new ideas coming in. You've got people who challenge the status quo, all that kind of stuff. Um, so it is important. You do want some of that. But it's definitely below the, below the other pieces on the, on, the, on, the, uh, on the list of skills. In the interest of time, I won't. I won't go through every other one that's on that list, but the ones that I'll call out maybe are uh, proactivity. Um, again, I think it, there, was, there was a really good example earlier on on the, on the challenge where you had that, the, the group who'd gone out and actually had to go really push quite hard to find the data to be able to solve their problem. And that's absolutely a, a problem you will find in, in business too, is that the data's not there or it's not quite in the shape you need it to be or doesn't sit with a person you think you've really got to be proactive to go out and find that. And that, that's a very, very important skill set, particularly as you're trying to bring together data sets and teams that maybe haven't worked together before and don't understand each other. Um, and then I think the other one I would call out, and the, the last one before we move on to the next slide, would be uh, curiosity. Um, and it's kind of related to, to, to that as well, in that you want people who are going to challenge the status quo, and you also want people, this is a very fast moving space, and that curiosity also kind of lends itself to people who are going to be prepared to learn and keep their skills up to date as they, as they go through their career. So I'll leave, it, I'll leave it at that on skills. OK. Now we're going to talk about number 10. <laughs> All right. So let's just assume for a second now that we've been to market, we've hired a team that has a good combination of these skills in the team. So I think the next question we've got to ask ourselves is, how do you motivate this team? Okay, so we've got the technical skills, we've got the behavioral skills, we've got the storytelling, the curiosity. How do we get motivation, right? How do we motivate this team? So for this, I'm gonna draw a little bit of inspiration from a behavioral scientist and an author called Daniel Pink. Um, there's a really good TED talk that Daniel gives about motivation. So if you've got some time, I'd really recommend that you jump on and, and read that. And what he does is he kind of debunks the, the carrot and stick theory. And, and what he's saying is, if the task that you're doing is mechanical in nature, then money and reward can be a motivation to drive better performance. And I think the example he gave was shooting a basketball hoop. So if you say to someone, here's, you know, here's 100 pounds to shoot the basketball hoop, in, in, on average, they're going to get better. Um, but when the task involved requires even just a rudimentary kind of cognitive input, it's actually the flip. So the more you reward something, the poorer the performance. And he really dives into that and has quite a lot of research behind you know, what's going on there. Um, 
and kind of boils it down to um, a new kind of intrinsic motivation that he classes as the new operating system for businesses, which is based around um, purpose, autonomy, and mastery. So he argues that these three things need to combine to really drive motivation. Um, so let's just talk about each of them in turn. So let's start with purpose. So I would argue that the role of a leader is to try and craft and create that purpose for a team. You know, we want to know that we matter, and we want to know that the work that we're doing matters as well. So being able to link the work that we're doing to the overall corporate strategy or what we're trying to achieve as a, as a business, I think, is really important. Um, written down a couple of quite interesting corporate missions that I think kind of bring this point to life. So Google used to talk about organizing the world's information and making it universally accessible and useful. So there's something that you can kind of corral around and you can understand that if you're at Google, as Sandy was, and you're working on a particular project, that ladders up in some way to that overall mission. And you understand how the work that you're doing contributes to that overall mission. So that's something that we've been spending a bit of time at the bank on and making sure that people understand that we're not doing data for the sake of doing data. We're doing data because it contributes to the bank's strategy. So we're doing that because it either delivers on a customer outcome or maybe a shareholder outcome. And that way, people can understand that the work that they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis ladders up to the overall corporate strategy and they understand the purpose of what they're trying to achieve. That's purpose. Skip back. Next one is autonomy. So I'm a really big believer in kind of uh, self-organizing teams. Um, thankfully, I think there's a bit of a move in, in industry away from the kind of command and control styles of management and leadership to one that's um, leveraging more contemporary leadership styles. So um, I know at the bank we're doing a lot of work around agile development, which leads you to creating small teams that um, can deliver, that are autonomous and can make decisions. So it's about decentralizing decision making as well. And we talked earlier about, I think, um, the types of roles that you need in that skill, that team as well, becomes really important. So it's not just data scientists, it might be data engineers in there as well. It might be business people, it might be lawyers. You know, depending on the problem that you're trying to solve, how you stack that team becomes really, really important so that you've got the skills in the team and the autonomy to deliver at pace. So I would argue that the role of the leader is to try and create that environment, and then it's more about checking in and saying what's blocking you, what impediments do you have, how can I help you deliver at pace, how can I get the rest of the organization out of your way and allow you to deliver. So that's autonomy. The last one's my personal favorite, mastery, which I would kind of rename just getting good at stuff. You know, we've seen the list of skills that Sandy put up. That is a big list of skills, right? And you're not going to get good at that overnight. That's hard yards. You know, you're going to take what you've learned at university and you're going to augment that through your career. Um, but it's very much a mindset. You know, we need to get into the mindset of mastering skills. Um, we've got amazing resources at our fingertips these days. Um, I'm a huge fan of um, Coursera, and there's just some great classes on Coursera, um, free, that you can do at your own pace. So this isn't something that you need to do nine to five, Monday to Friday. This is things that you can just pick up and put down again at your own pace. I remember I was telling uh, a friend about this in Melbourne, and it was nothing to do with the Stanford class I was taking at the time, but I was kind of, oh, I'm, I'm really buzzed about this class I'm taking. And he was like, what is it? And I said, Coursera, have you heard of it? And he said, I've never heard of it. So we kind of got our phones out and we got the, kind of the catalog of all the classes up on Coursera. And he wasn't in data at all. Um, his, his passion was actually history. But he hadn't done any learning since he left university. And we were able just to kind of look at this and he was saying, oh, there's a really couple of classes there I'd quite like to take. And I saw him a couple of weeks later and he'd got into the rhythm of you know, downloading lectures and listening to them in his car on the way to work in the morning. And he just got back into the mindset. You know, he'd got the bug again of kind of self-improvement and self-development. And I think it is just trying to get that, trying to get that mindset, because I'm always amazed at how far we can develop ourselves and how far we can push ourselves 
if we're in that mindset, if we're in that growth mindset. But the counter to this is just how quickly and easy it is to get out of that mindset and how hard it is to get back on again. So you, I think that's, that's the trick that we're trying to create at the bank is to get people into that mindset, back into the growth mindset, even if they haven't been there for 10, 20 years, and get people infected again. And, and it and becomes quite infectious. You know, people learn from each other. So if I was to try and summarize how do you motivate the dream team, um, I think it's the combination of these three strands. So we're trying to make sure that people have a purpose, that they understand the purpose of the work, and then try to create the environment where they've got enough autonomy to get the job done, and then the opportunity to develop. And when I think about some of the, I've been very lucky, I've worked for some great leaders in my career. And when I think about, you know, if I analyze that and say what made them great, it loosely comes back to those three things. Um, you know, it's people who've created that environment and probably the fourth that I would throw in is just someone who creates it with a little bit of fun, you know, doesn't take themselves too seriously. But I think ultimately it comes down to these three things. Okay, so that's how to motivate the team, Sandy. Should we? Last question. Yep. So these are questions we often get. We're going to give you both of our perspectives. You've seen where we've worked. You've seen that we've had exposure to different countries, different industries. But we often get asked these three questions. And I think there was, it's been mentioned already so far today. So first one, data. Should we centralize it or federate it? So from one perspective, it doesn't really matter. Just wait 18 months and the other one will come around, right? We know that. So it goes centralized, then it comes federated. Um, but from a serious point of view, I think there are certain things that, um, depending on the company and depending on where you are in the life cycle, makes sense to centralize. And I think there's other things that make sense to federate. So I don't know, do you want to give an example? Yeah, so I think, so I've actually only worked in federated teams um, while in, throughout my time as a, as, a, as a data professional. But uh, I was fortunate enough at Google that I spent, spent time there in a kind of, so Google is a kind of weird organization. So A, it's very big, B, it's grown up very quickly and see there wasn't really much oversight or control of the way in which it grew up. So you can end up with both of these models quite literally side by side. So I, I was working in a federated team under the, in the Americas marketing organization, a federated data team. There was a global marketing organization that we worked very closely with and they had a centralized team. And we worked very closely with them. So we ended up being able to see kind of the, the, the pros and cons of both, both models. So what I found was Compared to them, we found it easier to build relationships with the people we were working with because it was the same people over and over. It wasn't new teams all the time. Um, we found it easier to understand the data and the business questions because again, we were working with the same data sets and we were, working we were sitting next to all the time the people working on the business questions. So we, we had a much better understanding of that. Um, where, where we maybe had less or more of a problem, and we were actually very fortunate that we were able to partner with them, was um, even though the, the marketing organization was quite diverse and, and split out, we still all required support and resources from the same team in the tech function. Um, and us, as a, as a small federated team, it was very, very hard for us to even get their attention, let alone get any time and resources from them. Centralized team, on the other hand, they had enough, enough people there, enough clout, enough, enough need that they were able to get that time. So we would then, so what we did to, 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 to get past that and kind of the major roadblock for us, we partnered with them for that piece of it. Um, I think they, you know, they, their challenges were basically the opposite of our advantages and that they, they found it a bit harder to build relationships. They found it a bit harder to really understand the business questions they were, they were, they were getting to. The one thing that I think can sometimes be a challenge in a centralized team that they didn't find was you know, generating demand, but that was probably just a function of working in a company that actually understands data and the advantage of data very, very well compared to a lot of other organizations out there. Okay, so to give you a bit of an insight of how we're structured at the bank, it's not an either or, we're doing both. Um, so what we've done is we've kind of split data down the middle and we think about two different kind of sides of the data story. Um, one is data curation, so making sure that we are instrumenting our channels correctly, that we're generating the right data, 
that we're structuring it and storing it in the right place, that we've got the right tooling and environments around that. And we've centralized that for the reasons that Sandy gave, that you know, you're gonna make some large scale investments there and you wanna do that in a kind of centralized manner to make sure that you're getting bang for your buck. Um, <clears throat> what we've done is we've decentralized or federated the data consumption side to make sure that it's very close to the problems, the decision makers, and, and that way that you get the intimacy with the problems that you're trying to solve, and you've got the ear of the person that you ultimately have to kind of convince to take your data solution on. So we've kind of split it in half and gone centralized on one side and federated on the other, which seems to be working quite well for us, but like, like I said, you know, give it 18 months. Uh, the next one we often get is reporting lines. So where should data report? Um, I get this quite a lot, actually. <laughs> And since I've joined the bank, I've had three different reporting lines in, in 18 months, so it's obviously a, a hot topic. Um, my general sense on this is it's not that important, so I wouldn't sweat this one too much. Uh, I, I would really focus in on who that leader is that, that, you, that you report to, and is that, is that the right person? Because I think if you've got the right person who gets it, who gets data and can advocate for, for data, it doesn't really matter what their, their title is. Well, your perspective, Sandy? Yeah, so I think, you know, having worked in federated models, it's probably been a little less of a pertinent question. The only, the only thing I would say is that the, the, I, I spent a little bit of time in eBay uh, reporting, into, reporting directly into a, an engineering director, and that's, that's one scenario that I don't feel works particularly well because given the skill set you have as a data scientist, it's very easy for you just to be seen as another engineer to rely on when they're firefighting. So that, that, that is a bit of a challenge, I think. Yeah, uh, and I've definitely seen that as well, trying to put data science underneath a, a technology function. It sometimes gets kind of lost in the, in the mix and people try to apply standard technology processes to data science and you get that kind of friction. But yeah, I think ultimately it does come down to the, to the individuals involved though. And the last question we often get is this engagement model. So we've seen two different models today already. So Channel 4 talked about having these data kind of advocates who are almost like the bridge between hardcore data scientists and the business problem. Um, so I would call that a kind of three actor solution. So you've got the data scientist, you've got the translator, and you've got the kind of end buyer of the solution. Um, I, I compare that to a, a, a two actor model where you're essentially, you know, everyone has a certain amount of data literacy and can ask good questions and then we ask more of our data scientists such that they can you know, build those relationships directly with the people that have the business problems. I have a bias towards a two-actor model, but I've seen a three-actor model work in different industries as well. And, and I'm exactly the same on that, and you know, it's, I think it's, it's reflected in that set of skills you saw in that initial slide in that I look to ensure that I've got the, the skills spread across the team, but not necessarily focused in a single person so that we can we can just uh, set up the, the roles and engagements in the right way to manage that. Cool. So there you go, that's our talk finished. Hopefully that was quite insightful for you and gives you some insight into the work that we're doing at the bank. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, I'm gonna actually open up to the crowd first, but I do have two questions in my back pocket. So uh, does anyone have a question um, first they'd like to ask? Great, just at the back. Um, sorry, yeah, I, we probably need to get your mic. <laughs> Thanks very much for your talk. Um, Stefan Rauer, Global Rugby Network. Um, just wondering, obviously, uh, going back to your question one, there's a long list of things that you would like to have in your team or where do you start off? Like, what are your first hires in that team? You're focusing on technology, you're focusing on business, you're focusing on science. What was your process when you set up your team? So, so for me personally, um, it, I was very much focusing on the very, very hard technical skills. Uh, the reason for that is uh, I am building a, a data science team from scratch, but I have, uh, my, my, my remit is, is analytics in its broadest sense, so I already had uh, a customer insights team, I already had a, a modeling team, so we, a lot of the stuff that, that 
was around um, you know, business understanding, uh, the soft skills, all that. I already had that in the team, so it really was the new technical skills that were coming in. So, um, you know, that's, that's very situation specific in this particular situation. Uh, that said, I do very much have a bias to, you know, I said that, was a, that, that list was kind of roughly prioritized. Um, but I do, have a, I, I do have a strong bias generally. I, I want people in who have the, the, the real deep technical and analytical knowledge because that's the bit that in a business, I can't, I can't really teach you that. I can help you grow. I can help you develop your skills in that, but I can't teach you that from scratch. The stuff after that, the soft skills are, are, are much more coachable. Um, and then the business understanding and the like, again, you, you definitely want some people in who've got that, but again, you can disseminate that through the team as you go along. So that the bit that you just simply cannot do yourself is the, is the core, hard, technical, analytical skills. Thanks. Can I follow up that question, actually? And uh, which, uh, which of the skills you find most difficult to recruit for? Is it the technical skills or is it actually that you do have to find time coaching a lot in terms of softer skills and things it's, like that. So what, what, what I've actually found the most difficult, and so I, when I came here for this role, my biggest concern was going to be the, the recruitment team because I, I, I wasn't as in touch with everything that was going on in Scotland as I obviously am now. Mm -hmm. um, so I was actually, I was pleasantly surprised at how, uh, I'm not going to say it was easy, but it was easier than I expected to recruit across that skill set. Mm. at and, and this very much aligns with what we heard on the, on the Channel 4 presentation, at that kind of, graduate level, that entry level. So it's not actually specific skills, mm. it's finding people who have done this before, who have actual experience in the business and who can be, you need, you need a small number of people who are experienced and can lead and, and help you develop the team. That's the hard bit. Mm -hmm. So experienced hires are Absolutely. still, yeah. Absolutely. Um, is there any other questions from the audience at the moment? So I have one, okay, Brian. Yeah. This will be a hard one. <laughs> yeah. It's not going to be a hard one, it's just an observation from what we're seeing as well and I wondered, um, so ethics, so very much what we're thinking now is that actually data scientists should have an ethical dimension built into their skill sets as well yeah. because the responsible use of data in the context of a customer or a patient, we should really build in in their training from scratch so that it's there when they're, they're tackling problems. Do you guys think about that just now or? Yeah, it's something that the bank you know, treats very, very seriously, which yeah. is, you know, trust. Yeah. Um, you know, our customers are trusting us with their data and we need to manage that accordingly and, and, and use it appropriately. Um, so yeah, it's something we, we do spend a lot of time on. For me, it sits under the, it's kind of in the curation camp a little bit, which is data governance, uh, making sure that people understand what their responsibilities are working with the data. Mm and making sure that you know, as we remove quite a lot of the friction and make data easier to work with, that we still have that mindset that says, okay, there's an expectation here and that you, know, you need to align to the, I guess, the company policy and stance on these things. Yeah. Um, so we've got a couple of things that we do. You know, we make sure that everyone's getting training as they join in the bank, mm -hmm. just a, around these topics. Mm -hmm. um, we're very clear that we, we will only use data for good, not evil. So if we're using supermarket data, that's there to, offer someone a discount that's in their benefit, we won't use it the other way. So yeah, great question. It's front and center in, in what we're doing and we try and bake that into you know, new hiring as, as well. Great, thanks. Okay, we just have uh, one more question there. Just, uh... Hey guys, uh, so I'm a data science student and uh, I'm very curious about uh, in a large organization like a bank, a Salesforce bank, especially when you're a new data science team, how, how long it takes for you as a team to actually manage to deliver a product based on, like a data product, based on your findings? <laughs> and what's the process? Well, that <laughs> that's the subject I, of a whole other talk. Yeah, you know? that's, <laughs> I mean, I mean I'd, I'd, I'd say that in all honesty, we're probably just, uh, starting to find some of that out now so the, we've been we've been going through the process of building the team uh, and and getting the, the the platforms in place and, and the like um, but I get you know I think the other way to look at that is um, it really what, so what what you need to do in in the place that I'm where I'm building a new team is you need to you need to have two different views 
So you need to have a, a view that says, you know, people are investing in this data science team. Um, there, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a view from the bank, this is something they're prepared to put money into. They need to see a return from that. So we need to have, we need to do some, have some things that we can identify that we can turn around really quickly. Uh, and there's always things that you can do quickly. Uh, I think in, when you're coming into a, a place where you've got new, a new ability to take data and analyze it and, and, and utilize it to improve a product. Flip side, you've also got to think about you know, what, is, what is the strategic play here um, and, and how do we build a timeline that is going to allow us to get the long term, the full data advantage while still having enough kind of drops, proof points along the way that you keep people on the journey with you. So I know that's not a really a direct answer to your question, but it's probably as, as good as we have at the moment given where we are. So basically you try to act like a startup within a big company. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good way of thinking about it, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's, it's a good point because it's often an afterthought as people are thinking about the start of a project. You know, they don't think about how they're going to get that back into production and productize it. Um, there's some tricks we've got up our sleeve from an architectural point of view and platform, um, but it's something that's front and center in their mind, which is how can we remove that friction as well? So there's typically a friction between R&D, kind of data science work, which is I've got a good idea, I've got a good model. How do I get that implemented? So we've got to think about taking friction out of that last step as well. Okay, I think we have uh, one final question, uh, just at the back. Okay, uh, just following up on the earlier question on data governance, uh, what as a financial services supplier is your thinking towards keeping data in the cloud? Is that an option for you? Are you following that path? And if so, how, like public cloud versus private cloud? What's your uh, thoughts? Yep. And strategy. Yeah. So, so yes, we are looking at public cloud. Um, we're building out there, but I think you know you've heard, hopefully heard how seriously we treat you know data privacy and data security. So we are spending a lot of time in the design of that, and we're working with kind of real industry experts to make sure that when we build that out, we build it out in a very very secure, managed way, because we do want to benefit from some of the scale. Um, and innovation that's happening in public cloud, um, but how do we do that and protect the data at the same time? And that's really our kind of, I think the two things that we need to balance off against each other. Great, well, can I uh, ask for a, a round of applause for what was a fantastic talk and some great questions. Okay, so we're now coming to our, our, our final speaker of the day, which is uh, uh, Robin Huggins from uh, MBN Solutions. So uh, I, I wanted to say a couple of words. First of all, I think um, last year we decided to work with MBN uh, to help secure placements uh, for students on the Data Lab MSc, but also we've been working for a long time. And I think it, if it wasn't for Rob's drive, commitment, and uh, unstoppable energy, we wouldn't have got to what has already been such a successful program. So I'm pers personally very, very grateful for the amazing work he's done. Uh, and he's going to talk to you today about what this event's you know, all about. What is the Data Scientist 2.0? So can I ask for a big round of applause for Rob, who's done so much to support us over the last year. Thank you, Rick. Don't run away, Josh. I might need some tech support here, oh, fellas, where we can get going. Uh, I don't know if I can remember the strokes. Uh, and the clicker. Where? Oh. So we want this in, how do we get that into um, start right, start. Good afternoon. Um, so I am Robin Huggins, Head of Business Development at MBN Solutions. So a little bit of background um, about myself, firstly. Um, so I went to University of Glasgow and I studied psychology and politics. And in psychology, I was really interested in theories of learning and theories of motivation. And then I topped that up um, by uh, doing a postgrad in human resource management and getting a kind of industry slant. And I'll come back to this about the, the importance of, a, of an industry slant to the studies that I undertook. And I began in technology, actually not far from here, uh, as a researcher for a company uh, in 2000. But in 2002, my world changed. Um, in 2002, as a technology recruiter, I placed my first data analyst. Um, Reassuring to think that today, which is 15 years later, not much has changed about the recruitment of, of data professionals. It was all about the technology skill set 
but it was also about the domain expertise. And that hasn't changed very much in the last 15 years at all. I've been very, very fortunate that I um, started working with a, a very visionary boss just uh, seven and a half years ago, Mr. Michael Young, um, and have been working at MBN Solutions ever since, continuing to practice the art of recruitment for the data space, but augmenting it more recently with, uh, with some work within universities, um, and also looking at this challenge around employability. Now, the work within universities began in 2014. Uh, the first university I visited was the University of Oxford um, with a chap called James Morgan who at the time was heading up management information at Centrica. And James and I had met at an event and we'd shared the beer and we got to talking and I mentioned that at the time I'd noticed quite a challenge in recruitment within data where organisations were, were asking for something that sometimes we couldn't find. And James has said, well, typically, abruptly, well, what are you going to do about it then? And I said, well, would it not be an idea to go into universities and talk to students and tell them that the data industry was out there and it was a fantastic place to work, but there were certain skill sets that would or would not be required in order to get a job there. And James said, that's a great idea. Um, why don't we do it together? Lo and behold, we ended up University of Oxford, where James came up with a phrase, and the phrase that he used was lost souls. And lost souls were people who were going through university, who were gaining the skills and experience that would be looked upon favorably within the data industry, but who weren't aware of the great opportunities that the data industry provided them. So my mission from 2014 has been to try and take the message to people who may become lost souls. The second university I ever visited was the University of Cambridge, with Sanjeev and Bala. And Sanjeev and MBN Solutions had been working at the time, and we'd been looking to help them build the data science function. And it became quite important at that point in time, and this is early 2015, that there was a job that needed done and the job that needed done was to, in as many ways as possible, act as a bridge between that academic community and the needs of the business community that we operate within. So, lo and behold, halfway through last year, MBN Solutions were uh, awarded the, uh, the tender for the MSC Placement Project. And I was very, very fortunate that I was the guy that was chosen to kind of lead this up from, from the MBN Solutions perspective. So what I actually did um, through the project was kind of in three phases, if you like. And the first phase was to visit the universities and to work with the students, firstly on broad employability skills, and then secondly on developing a dialogue and a communication with the students after the visits to try and make sure that we acted as a, a kind of sounding board and a touch point for them, if you like, through that little journey that led to the placement. Then I worked with organizations to, to help them refine their project plans. And then finally, I was the person who was largely responsible for acting as, a, I suppose, the, the middleman in the coming and going. And I think if, if I was to look at another alternative career, if anybody out there needs a cat herder, I think that would be quite an easy job after doing what I did last year. This isn't the only thing that I do. And in fact, yesterday with, with Jude from the Data Lab, I, I visited a high school um, where we spoke to <laughs> groups of S1, S2, and all the way up S5 and S6 pupils. And uh, it was a tough gig, man. Um, talking in a room full of 200 S1 pupils can be a little bit of a challenge. I'm a STEM ambassador. I believe passionately in taking the message to younger generations. Um, I'm an active member of Founders for Schools. I visit schools and I talk about the great careers that you guys do. I'm sort of a basking in the reflected glory of others because, as I mentioned, from a uni university education, I'm not a mathsy stats guy, but I stand in awe of the people who are. And finally, I've, I've been recently appointed to the University of Glasgow's School of Maths and Stats Industri Industry Advisory Board, where I'm going to hopefully give a little bit of input into some of the things that those guys might be doing to help to kind of bridge this gap in a little bit more. Hopefully my clicker will work. Oh, doesn't look as if a clicker is working. Technical support guy. Yeah. Oh, Backwards, oh. yeah. You're just making this tricky for Sorry, me. Sorry, this is terrible for me. Just back to front. Is that right? No, it's just going to the next one. There we go. Okay. So an overview of the MSC placement project. What does it actually involve? So some of the figures have been talked about earlier on, and, and this is what it actually meant. 
So there was almost 50 students finally matched with 32 different businesses. The businesses were largely split 50-50 almost between the public and private sector. And I, th I suppose that's the first observation that I would like to make. And we've heard that mentioned today. Um, really good to see the public sector taking advantage of this. Um, I think as citizens of this country, it's really refreshing to know that the people who are running the services on our behalf get this. Really important. Um, so moving into it, and we'll do the backwards arrow thing. I had some really good glib phraseology to use on this about our purpose. I think our purpose was summed up earlier on when Lauren and Anita made their little speeches. I had a tear rolling down one eye with Lauren and a tear rolling down the other with Anita. The purpose was today. That's why we did this. As I mentioned earlier on, um, I'm really fortunate and I work for a business that gets this and was prepared to allow me to, to, to really work hard to help bridge that gap. We believe in this community. We believe in this community passionately. My boss has put his money where his mouth is. We've organized events. We've organized meetup groups. My time out of the office has been paid for. We get this and we really passionately care about this. And we've got skills. You don't spend 15 years recruiting data people. And I was talking to my boss the other day about it and I said, how many data folk do you think you've recruited? And many have I recruited and it's hundreds, possibly into the thousand. So we've got skills and we know how people get jobs. So we thought, well, we've got this community and we're helping to build this community. Why not share our skills and expertise with the community? And that's what the employability stuff was all about. It was about helping people to understand that when they had that snapshot, that window of opportunity to sit in front of guys like Mark and Sandy, that there were certain things that you should and shouldn't do. But nobody had thought about teaching that to people properly. So we got involved and we wanted to teach it to them. What we wanted to do was to share our expertise and our enthusiasm with data folks in all walks of life. And this project gave us the opportunity to do that. We wanted to try and create placement opportunities. And we wanted, obviously, to try and see whether those placement opportunities would eventually lead to something further. So how we did it? Um, firstly, as I mentioned, I work for uh, a pretty visionary guy but he also happens to be a marketing machine. And he's the master of the midnight email. And between my boss and the boss of the data lab, they sent out a whole load of communications. They raised the profile of the project. They sent out a whole load of social media messages, which we were able to retweet and rebroadcast. But then, and anybody who tells you that the cold call is dead, didn't sit beside me through the months of January to March, because the cold call is not dead. And all of you folks out there that took calls from me, that met me for coffees, that allowed me to badger you and allowed me to try and convince you that this was something worth doing. We, we raised the marketing effort massively to try and ensure that we could touch as many parts of the country as possible. An awful lot of organizations were interested, but not every organization made it to the finishing line. I had to evaluate the projects. I had to ensure that there was both commercial and academic purpose to them. My colleagues in the data lab helped massively in that extent because, as I mentioned, I'm not a data guy, but they are. So there was quite a few times that I'm going, hey, I'm going to look at this, going to tell me if this is okay. The evaluation exercise was excellent. And then we began the matching. The matching began when we met students for the first time and we had some dialogues with them and we sent them out some communications and we tried to get an idea of what they were looking for because at the same time that marketing machine had been running in the background and we started receiving communications from companies saying, we're looking for somebody who can do this. So we started matching. And then after the matching, we facilitated the meetings. Now we'd gone in and we'd spoken about the importance of meeting companies and how you should work, how you should present yourself, how you should talk and how you should communicate. And we acted as the middlemen to make sure that that process happened smoothly. And then finally at the end, um, we passed it all back to the data lab. We kind of handed it all over in a nice neat sealed box with a little report. And Josh and I had a beer. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we cried on each other's shoulders and then we high-fived and we moved on. Josh was really, really nice in the things that he said about me and doing this thing, but I'm not the true hero here. The true hero here is every individual in every one of these companies who took ownership of this thing. Because if those individuals hadn't taken ownership of this thing and driven it through their own organisation, I'd look pretty stupid standing here today. So a big round of applause for everybody, please, that did this.
And we commented at the time when we started seeing this final list take shape, and we looked at it and we went, wow. No, truly, wow. Some really big brands and some really small companies that are doing brilliant things, public sector, private sector, everybody you could think of was involved in this, to a greater or lesser extent. But we talked about the Data Scientist 2.0, and what I'm going to do now is have a little look beneath the bonnet, if you like, at some of the findings that we discovered and how they relate to the Data Scientist 2.0. whole idea about data being a team sport, well, I'm not a data guy, this definitely was a team sport. And the person responsible for this brilliant analysis and visualization, Georgia Boyle, who works beside me, um, who done some great work on this, and I'd like to thank her very much for this. First thing we discovered, and I am not going to enter into the R versus Python debate, because I know we could be here all day, but reassuringly, by a huge distance, R and Python were the most requested software that we saw throughout the duration of the project. And I know that that argument will continue to run and run and run. However, be assured that Scottish businesses are using the most current up-to-date software packages out there. We're not being asked to do stuff primarily in Excel spreadsheets. It's R and Python and all the cool, sexy stuff that people want to use. We looked at the different types of expertise that were asked for, and we did see some of the more advanced stuff, the machine learning, artificial intelligence stuff, recommender systems being requested. But what we've seen being requested massively was foundation skills in data analytics. Now that is, firstly, from a recruitment guy's perspective, massively reassuring to see that amount of Scottish organizations stepping up to the plate and saying, we have a data asset that we want to analyze. We've got data that we want to explore, we want to exploit, we want to utilize. It augurs well for the future to see this level of enthusiasm for data analytics within Scottish businesses. And Michael earlier on touched upon it. We used to live out of suitcases. I've been recruiting for 15 years. At least 10 of those years have been spent in and out of London. We're seeing a change in Scotland. We're seeing Scotland growing its taste and its appetite for data analytics. And this is really good news, especially for me, because it means less using the red eye. Within the sectors that we looked at, it didn't come as any great surprise to see financial services and public sector represented very, very highly. There's, there's, no, there's no surprise as to why we had folks like Rob and Jenny on the panel earlier on. The financial services sector in Scotland is huge, and so is the public sector. However, when we look at the data another way, Oops, yeah, that's us. And look at me with my data visualizations. Thank you, Georgia. What was really refreshing to see was when we grouped together new technology stuff like gaming and media, that there's almost as much appetite for data science within those newer areas as there, in, uh, as there are within financial services and the public sector. And again, I think this augurs well for the future. There is an appetite out there. There are businesses doing newer, fresher stuff <coughs> that are really, really keen to utilize the skills and abilities of the people that the universities are producing. And then we look at location, and this is the major challenge. By far and away, the majority of placements were across the central belt between Glasgow and Edinburgh. And personally, I would like to see Dundee step up to the plate. I had a conversation with Sanjeev last night about it, and obviously he's got contacts within Channel 4's gaming side. And I'm hoping that what we might see is that Dundee step up to the plate next year because there's some fantastic gaming companies up in Dundee. But what we found was that there maybe wasn't just the, the right appetite or the right uh, level of, 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 of um, organizations being ready for this. So maybe moving forward, we're going to see a change. We're going to see Dundee and we're going to see Aberdeen step up a little bit more in terms of their appetites. And of what happened next, well, the what happened next we already know about, and Josh and I have agreed that we need to start talking to each other a little bit more clearly, or a little bit more often, because we keep hearing of students who have secured further employment through this scheme. Permanent roles, extensions to contracts, KTP programs. We know of at least a dozen, possibly more already, that have secured future employment through this scheme, and a very well done to all of them. But when we start to look a little bit more deeper at domain expertise and why it's important for Data Scientist 2.0, 
we can throw up some slides and some quotes from some people in the game who seem to know what they're talking about. And what domain expertise really means is the ability to understand when a certain solution is appropriate for a certain business area. And without that knowledge, the Data Scientist 2.0 won't reach its full potential. And I think everybody in this room will be familiar with this piece of text. It comes from the sexiest job title of the 21st century piece. But it's the bit at the bottom that I think is really important. And while people without strong social skills might thrive in traditional data professions, data scientists must have such skills to be effective. That's not to say you don't need to be a social butterfly and outgoing and gregarious and always. There are obviously roles for everybody within data. But the Data Scientist 2.0 will have that domain expertise, the soft skills that we've heard about all today and how important they are. The Data Scientist 2.0 will have them. And looking at what Saluja, Gupta, and Perez wrote, and this is from Airbnb's Academy piece, they've written about it too. And what they've said, being good with data is important, but at Airbnb we need the insights to be well translated to all audiences, from a data scientist to the CEO. Otherwise, the recommendations might not have the impact that they merit. I would highly recommend, if you haven't read Paul Forrest's piece, Data Scientist 2.0, that you go and have a read through it. It's available on the MBN Solutions website, and it's a really, really co cool and clever piece of work. What the Data Scientist 2.0 will mean to organizations is the ability to look at a number of different areas, to be able to translate qualifications into skill sets that are actionable within business, to encourage the collaboration and the understanding of business strategy. And to take you back to my very early career as a recruiter, I recruited primarily for analysts that were working within the customer and marketing space. But the modern data scientist, the data scientist 2.0, will work across all business domains. And it's highly important that that understanding and appreciation of the wider business strategy is gained. To provide that clarity of purpose beyond the job spec, to understand fully what the skill set means, the role and articulate this fully. And for employers to be able to articulate that big picture. How does an individual skill and experience complement the function or business? What Mark and Sandy were saying earlier about not finding all those skills in one individual, finding it across two or three people, and how that jigsaw fits together. And it will allow employers to cross-fertilize ideas to collaborate and work across multidisciplinary teams. For academics, what the Data Scientist 2.0 should mean is to help break down the data science silo. I mentioned earlier about working with schools, about working with the up and coming generation of talent. The Data Scientist 2.0 model suggests that academics should take ownership of this issue at every level of education. To look at schools, to look at what's going on in primary, secondary, college and university and to promote these skills widely to encourage all the elements within the education sector to promote data literacy. And finally, to build and develop those ties with industry, which eventually today are all about. And for data scientists, they absorb the thought leadership in the subject, looking at the problem and understanding that the solution may well be yourself. But most importantly, to learn to talk the language of business in addition to the language of data. So some final thoughts and some practical takeaways. As I mentioned earlier, it's not a Martin Luther King speech that I have a dream, but I do have a dream, and I'm unashamed about that. I'm an ambitious guy. And I have a vision where employers and universities work in collaboration and they work in tandem, where course leaders introduce themselves to people in business, where they sit down for coffees, where people visit universities and save those lost souls. Because it can happen if there, if there is a will within the community. For employers to go in and volunteer during Employability Week, I go down to the University of Hertfordshire every year now and take part in their Employability Week. They invited me, so I came. It's really, really important for businesses to reach out to universities and to ask, what can I do? Can I come in? Can I come and meet people? Can I talk? Formalize that relationship through the variety of placement and internship opportunities that are available. Okay, we're here to talk about MSc placement project. 
There are other alternatives, but you need to make it happen. And I'm hearing some great stories from different people in the room today about how they have worked on different types of placement, different types of internship. And we've heard how important it is for that cross-fertilization of ideas to happen. And a commitment to growing your own is highly important. It's not turkeys voting for Christmas. I'm a professional recruiter. However, I see the sense and logic in businesses looking to invest in an academy model to work closely with universities, hire that graduate talent. And the last little glib phraseology, don't blame the game. Don't moan about a data talent shortage if you're not doing something about it. Change the game. And for academics, do exactly the same thing. Look at the businesses that are located around your organization. Look at where students go to work after they finish the course and invite them for a coffee. Make the first move. If we all meet halfway, if we all do something and we all meet halfway, then there's loads of us going to be standing in the middle. Set up industry advisory boards, invite collaboration. And we heard earlier on from, from Rob and Brian who are involved in these type of things and myself, my first day is tomorrow on my industry advisory board. There's loads of universities out there running loads of courses. Make sure people are on those advisory boards that can help. And finally, for academics, acknowledge that there is a difference. Language, timings, and terminology. Acknowledge that your agenda is different to the agenda of business. And once again, try and collaborate and meet in the middle. And for the data scientists, learn to dedicate as much time to learning about that domain. And I take you back to what Sanjeev spoke about this morning. The challenges that they had within the channel, trying to convince stakeholders that this new, shiny, fancy data science thing was something worth changing a business process for. Learn about that domain expertise. Attend events, attend meetup groups, grab business guys and talk to them. Understand their challenges, understand what data is being used for within businesses. Read articles on business application, not just the theory behind the applications you use. And finally, practice those soft skills constantly. It was amazing to see students take to the stage today and speak publicly. More of that, the better. Practice the soft skills, volunteer, coach, teach, and collaborate, and make sure that you're learning to talk the language that business people talk every day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was quicker uh, that didn't work. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it's terrible. Um, so I have a couple of questions first. Um, so next year we have 130 uh, students. Uh, so what messages would you have uh, for the companies and public sector organisations in the room regarding that? <laughs> Get ready for me kicking your door down. <laughs> um, no, the message I would have, um, I'm, I'm not an employer. We, we didn't hire a data scientist, but the message I've had back from everybody I've spoken to has been almost 100% positive. So the, the, the news, I suppose, is for, for those that did successfully take part, brace yourself, <laughs> because I'm coming again. <laughs> um, I'm going to be shouting you for coffees. I'm going to be begging. I'm going to be pleading. I'm going to be bribing. But we're going to find those places. And for those that didn't take part, I'm not hard to find. I'm all over social media. I'm all over LinkedIn. Drop me a line. Set me a time. We'll meet for a coffee, and we'll talk it through. We spoke about bigger and better. Well, bigger and better is a reality. There's no point being in this game if you don't want to set the bar higher. Um, it is going to be bigger. It is going to be better. And make sure you're on board for it. So, is there any other questions uh, from the audience at the moment? Is anyone specifically? Well, I, um, I think there's one thing. We know that, uh, we know that Scotland needs more data scientists. Yeah. We need, um, to, there's plenty of risks coming up in the future. And, uh, and I, I think we also need data scientists, as you've described well, that have experience in industry so they can actually get to grips with practical problems. Um, so I guess a, a pitch from myself as well is if you are interested in the, the master's program, then do come speak to Rob. Uh, um, I, I think there's loads of exciting opportunities. We've seen how it's worked really, really well. Um, and I think the second thing is, if uh, there are other opportunities as well to get data science into your organisation, so do speak to us both if there's, if there's any interest there. Um, Rob, do you have any final thoughts, anything else you wanted to just say uh, on the project or, or about today or anything like that? I just think that today is the culmination of, of an awful lot of intense hard work, 
from the students, from, from all the people who took part in this, the, the, the host companies, from Data Lab and obviously from everybody at MBN that was involved in it. Just, just thank you and well done to everybody. It's been an amazing adventure. Um, I've enjoyed myself. It's been, it's been unbelievable. And I suppose when we look at what was said earlier with regards to, to Jenny's discussion around um, continuous professional learning, this time last year I had to start equipping myself with a whole new set of skills. You know, cat herding mastered. You know? um, I didn't think um, that, that what I had been doing with universities over the last few years would end up in this. Um, it happened. We went for it. It was great. And the most important thing is that everybody at this beginning their data science journey understands and, understands and recognizes that, that the learning starts now. You know? it, the learning isn't over. Look at me, I'm nearly 50 and I'm still learning. Mm -hmm. So the learning continues and will continue throughout your, your career. And it's just down to you to kind of take advantage of that and make the most of it that you can. Great, can we have a big round of applause for Rob Higgins? Thank you. So I'm doing a little bit of uh, final, uh, final um, mentions. Um, so the reason we um, the reason we did this event was because, like I said, there we we need more data scientists in Scotland. We've had a great cohort of students this year who've done some amazing things, and some of you are just starting on a data scientist science journey uh, with universities and hopefully with some of the companies in the room as well. So I think the first thing is just thank you all for coming along. Um, it's been. Uh, a really great event. I, I, mean, I think I'd like to thank Sanjeevan, of course, from Channel 4, who did a great talk. Uh, I, I'd like to thank Sarah, of course, from Thorntons, Mark and Sandy from Sainsbury's Bank, uh, Rob, uh, and everyone else who, who's spoken today to talk about data science in Scotland. We think, uh, we think there's plenty of opportunities. We're seeing lots of opportunities for data scientists now. Um, so I also wanted to thank all the exhibitors here who have not only uh, not only sort of shown what they can do and what they can offer, but have donated to charity as part of this, which is which is really really great. Um, I want to thank the panel uh, and Paul Forrest, uh, who I thought was a really uh, it was a really interesting discussion, uh, and um, again some some great opportunities for everyone here. Um, I think most important, I want to thank MBN Solutions, not just Rob for all the great work he's done and all the team who are here today helping get everything working. And I want to thank Georgia, who's, who's starting to work on the placements project for next year. Uh, but specifically, I really want to thank Michael and thought about it or conceived of it a couple of months ago. And here we are, 200 people in a room talking about things that matter for Scotland. So can I ask a really, really big round of applause for, for Nicola and Michael in particular? So uh, I also know that the Data Lab and, and a lot of my colleagues, Simona, uh, Brian, uh, and others have, have put a lot of effort into this as well. So harder to. it's been a real team effort and uh, a great output. And I want to sort of leave with probably um, two, two thoughts, really. One is if you're, if you're a company or an organization uh, and you're interested in, in data science talent, then you know who to come to. The Data Lab is here, MBN Solutions is here. We want to help. We want to get Scottish trained data scientists into Scottish based organisations. That is why we're here. Uh, and I think if you're a student, you're just starting out, or you're looking for jobs, then again, come to us. We can help you get that job in Scotland, or we can help you develop the skills that you need to become successful in Scotland. So they're the two reasons why we're here. Get in touch with us both. Um, and uh, another big thank you for everyone who's been involved in organizing, attending, speaking, uh, and just enjoying today. Uh, so a, a big thank you to everyone. Um, and then the final thing is we do have an opportunity to continue networking upstairs until about five o'clock. Uh, so please do, after, after I finish talking, go make your way up, keep on meeting new people, uh, speaking to people you haven't met and making those connections are going to be so important to driving Scotland's data science future. So thank you very much. <laughs>